Chapter 5 Therapy of Acedia Despondency In our description of the passion of Acedia Despondency, we have seen that one of its distinguishing marks is that it attacks all the soul's faculties and stirs up almost all the passions. Consequently, it signifies the death of all the virtues. However, unlike the other passions, acedia cannot be healed and replaced by one single virtue that would be specifically opposed to it. St. John Climacus teaches, quote, Each of the passions is destroyed by some particular virtue, but despondency is a general death. From step 13 of the latter. This characteristic necessitates a multiform therapy, as St. John Cashin stresses, whoever, quote, longs to comp- Complete legitimacy in the contest for perfection will struggle against this pernicious spirit of acedia on all sides. The course of therapy presupposes that the illness has been brought to light and diagnosed as such, for this passion is known to lack any motive, and thus to be often unconscious or incomprehensible. This is all the more so since one of its main effects is to blind the intellect of the noose and to darken the entire soul. For this reason, St. John Cashin writes again that whoever wishes to fight as is fitting must, quote, be swift to purge this disease out of the recesses of his soul from institutes. And for his part, Abba Piman notes, quote, if man recognizes this passion for what it is, he obtains rest. From the alphabetical sayings of the Desert Fathers. Since on the one hand, the passion manifests itself, especially in the case of a hermit, in the need to leave one's cell, to move about, to come into contact with other people. It is key, first of all, to recognize that the justifications of this need man makes for himself are nothing but vain pretexts dictated by the passion itself. Knowing this helps so as not to give in to this need. With one accord, the Holy Fathers recommend that when the passion presents itself under this guise, one ought to fight it and resist by endeavoring, first of all, not to leave the place where one finds oneself, no matter the pretext. Evagrius writes, quote, The time of temptation is not the time to leave one's cell, devising plausible pretexts. Rather, stand there firmly and be patient. Bravely take all that the demon brings upon you, but above all, face up to the demon of acedia and despondency. Practicos, chapter 28. He advises further, quote, when the spirit of Assyria rises up against you, do not leave the house. Do not shirk the battle. St. John Cashin also notes that man must first fight against the spirit of Assyria in this, such a way that he not quit the monastic enclosure and become a deserter on any specially pious pretext whatsoever. When despondency appears, In the form of a tendency toward drowsiness, it is also fitting to resist it by striving not to give in to dozing or sleep. In every case, remarks St. John Cashin, It has been proved by experience that the attacks of despondency should not be avoided by flight, but resisted and overcome. Giving in to acedia would be, in any case, a bad solution, one that would only exasperate the illness. St. John Cashin knows notes, quote, thus the unhappy soul is vexed and assaulted by these wiles of the enemy until it gives in to sloth or becomes used to leaving the enclosure of the cell and finding consolation from this burden and visiting other monks. What it uses as an immediate remedy soon becomes a dangerous complaint in itself, for the adversary will assault the victim more often and more severely once he knows that he will turn his back if engaged in close conflict, and sees that he puts his hope only in flight, not in victory or resistance. End of quote from St. John Cashin's Institutes. Elsewhere, the same saint says of those attacked by despondency, quote, if they concede themselves the freedom of going out often, they will bring a worse plague upon themselves by this remedy, as they think it is. It is the same with certain people who believe that they can quell the force of internal fevers with a drink of very cold water, when in fact it is clear that this stirs up the fire rather than settling it, since a far graver sickness follows the momentary relief. End of quote. Just as this cause of despondency 
lies not in man's solitary condition, but in his interior. So too is the source of the healing of this illness to be sought in man's relationship with himself and not in his relations with others. In most cases, the impression of being able to receive help from others is a false one. St. Isaac the Syrian writes on this subject, quote, The health and the healing of the man whose soul has become darkened comes to him from Hezekiah. Footnote, Dr. Lachey writes, Let us recall that the Greek word means at once silence, calm, both inner and outer, and solitude, or Hezekiah. Therein lies his consolation, to continue the quote. No one finds the light of consolation in the company of men, nor has anyone been healed by the relations he maintains with them. Assyria leaves him but for a moment, so as to assail him afterwards with greater violence. Blessed is he who endures such temptations by remaining in his cell. End of quote, ascetical homily 57. To continue, of course, the fathers admit that in certain cases, it is absolutely necessary to meet with an illumined man who has experience of these things in order to receive from him illumination and strength. But this can only be the exception. St. Nilsorsky likewise advises such meetings only with much reservation. Quote, Sometimes one has need, as St. Basil the Great said, of entering into contact and conversation with an experienced and edifying man, since a visit at a useful time and with good intention Moderate converse with such a man without pointlessness or idle chatter is able not only to drive the soul from the acedia hidden within it, but also to procure for the soul some rest and to restore strength and zeal for the combat to come. However, the fathers, after reflecting on the matter in light of their own experience, say that at the moment of temptation, it is better to remain in one's cell without taking leave of Hezekiah. End of quote. Through fighting in solitude and resisting the passion, man gains the greatest profit, since his soul is tested and strengthened by this combat. For this reason, Evagrius writes, quote, When the spirit of Assyria rises up against you, do not leave the house and do not shirk the profitable battle at the opportune moment, for your heart will be made radiant, as when one burnishes silver. And again, quote, The time of temptations is not the time to leave one's cell, Rather, bravely take on all that the demons bring upon you. But above all, face up to the demon of Assyria, who is in the most grievous of all, and who on this account will effect the greatest purification of soul. And St. Isaac notes, quote, Blessed is he who endures such temptations by remaining in his cell. For as the Holy Fathers say, great will be the dwelling place and power to which he shall attain after this. Sedical Homily 57. Nevertheless, resisting the passion never bears fruit right away. Almost always, the victory over despondency presupposes a long and diligent battle. Also, the course of therapy demands, above all, that one be patient and persevere. Thus, the virtue of patience seems to be one of the main remedies of this passion. Evagrius writes, Acedia is quelled by patience. End of quote. And St. Maximus underscores that this therapy has been given to us by Christ himself. Quote, Listlessness, that is, acedia, despondency, seizes control of all the soul's powers and rouses almost all the passions together. That is why this passion is more serious than all the others. Hence our Lord has given us a more excellent remedy against it, saying, You will gain possession of your souls through your patient endurance. Hope appears to be another fundamental remedy, one that must be joined to patience. A man of good hope is a slayer of despondency. With this sword of his hope, he routs it out, teaches St. John Climacus. Step 30. To continue. And Evagrius counsels, when we meet with the demon of Assyria, we are to sow seeds of a firm hope in ourselves while we sing with the Holy David, why are you filled with sadness, O my soul? Why are you distraught? Trust in God, for I shall give praise to him. He it is who saves me, the light of the eyes of my soul and my God. The hope to be implemented is not only that of being delivered in the long run from this passion and of obtaining rest, 
but also the hope of receiving future blessings, which, as St. John Climacus notes, constitutes the judgment of this passion and its utter death. A third essential remedy is repentance, a change of direction, matanya, mourning and compunction. If man, quote, remembers his sins, God is his helper in all things, and he does not suffer from despondency, teaches an elder the sayings of the Desert Fathers. For his part, St. John Climacus advises, quote, let this tyrant be bound by the remembrance of your sins. And he continues, he who mourns over himself does not know despondency. The tears that follow on repentance and spiritual mourning clearly appear to be an even more powerful remedy. Evagrius notes, Ocidia is quelled by tears and writes further, Shedding tears is a great remedy against the nocturnal visions engendered by Ossidia. The prophet David applied this remedy wisely to his passions when he said, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. Psalm 6.6 6. Another important remedy is the remembrance of death, a basic ascetic practice that consists in man constantly remembering that he is mortal, and that his death could come about at any moment. Connected to this remembrance of death is the advice often formulated by the fathers of living each day as if it were the last. Counsel which has in mind not so much man's preparation to die a good death, but to live a good life. In effect, the main function of the remembrance of death is to help man not to waste the precious time given for salvation, to redeem the time as the Holy Apostle says in Ephesians 5.16, and thus to live each moment with the greatest spiritual intensity, to avoid sin, to practice the divine commandments, and to give oneself over completely to God. The remembrance of death is particularly efficacious in the case of Assyria, insofar as the latter constitutes a state of a spiritual nonchalance, lethargy, sloth. It makes man negligent with regard to his salvation, and drives him to futile activities, movements, and relations, all of which form, from the spiritual point of view, distraction and a loss of time. One of the sayings of the fathers recounts, someone asked an elder, why are you never discouraged? And he replied, because I expect to die every day. And St. Anthony the Great teaches, so as not to be negligent, it is good for us to meditate on this word of the apostle, I die every day, 1 Corinthians 15.31. Indeed, if we live as though we were to die every day, we shall never sin. Behold, what must be understood by this, every day when we rise, let us think that we shall not last until the evening, and likewise when we are about to lie down, let us think that we shall not awake. From the life of St. Anthony. Evagrius advises one to counter the thoughts of Assyria with these scriptural verses. Quote, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. Psalm 102. And our days on earth are a shadow. Job 8, 9. And are not the days of my life few. Job 10:20. And on this topic, he recalls the teaching of his own spiritual father, quote, Our holy and most ascetic master stated that the monk should always live as if he were to die on the morrow. For he said, By this attitude you'll be able to cut off every thought that comes from Assyria and thus become more fervent in his monastic practices. Practicos 29. This is justified by the foregoing considerations, but also by the fact that the demon of Ossidia, as Evagrius notes, quote, depicts to man life stretching out for a long period of time in suffering, thereby seeking to arouse in him laxity and revulsion at the difficulties to come, especially at the toil of the ascetic struggle. The fear of God also forms a powerful antidote to this passion. Nothing is as efficacious, states St. John Climacus. Among the remedies prescribed by the Holy Fathers, we must also mention manual labor. Such work can help man avoid boredom, instability, torpor, 
and sleepiness, which in part make up this passion. Manual labor can continue to be established or maintaining the diligence and the continuity of presence, effort, and attention that are presupposed by the spiritual life and that despondency seeks to break. Above all, such work is directed, directly opposed to idleness, one of the main forms that a city takes, and a source of innumerable ills, great darkness. Referring to St. Paul's teaching, St. John Cassian presents at length manual labor as a remedy for despondency, which he essentially envisions in this particular guise. He writes, quote, the Holy Apostle Paul, being a true doctor of the Spirit, was instructed by the Holy Spirit to discern the evil which arises from a spirit of ascidia when it first creeps in or when it lies hidden among the monks and is quick to offer healing remedies in his teaching. Writing to the Thessalonians, as an experienced and skillful doctor, at first he treats his patients' ills with soothing and gentle words. Beginning in charity, he praises them up to a point until the deadly virus is mollified by such easy remedies and the swelling of indignation has abated and they become capable of enduring the more drastic remedy. End of quote from Institutes, chapter 10. After stressing the therapeutic approach taken by the Apostle, St. John Cassian then reveals the precepts constituting the proposed remedies. One, aspire to live quietly, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. That is to say, he comments, quote, stay in your cells and be not disturbed by various rumors. 2. Mind your own affairs. That is to say, be not eager in your curiosity to find out about the doings of the world and to hear the opinions of many, giving your attention not to your own improvement or the love of virtue, but to running down your brethren. 3. Work with your hands, as we charged you. The same Holy Father then recalls and comments on the example that St. Paul gives us of his own behavior in the second epistle to the Thessalonians. Quote, you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. With toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not burden any of you. Second Thessalonians 3, or 7 and following. After citing what follows of this passage in which St. Paul evokes those who are, quote, living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work, St. John Cashin observes that the apostle is quick to apply the appropriate remedy. He resumes the compassion of a gentle doctor. He confers on them professional advice for healing, saying, Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ, to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living. Like a skilled doctor with a single piece of healthy advice, he treats the cause of so many ulcers which erupt from the infection of idleness. He well knows that the other evil effects which arise from the same disease will be effectively eliminated once the original infection has been cured. At the same time as he stresses the therapeutic value of St. Paul's counsels with regard to manual labor, St. John Cashin also points out their preventative value. Quote from Institutes, chapter 10, consisting, consistently acting like a wise and discerning doctor, he not only strives to cure the ills of those who suffer, but also to preserve the well in their good health and gives them similar useful advice. To close his teaching on this point, St. John Cashin cites the example of Abba Paul, who, although living too far away from any village where he would have been able to sell the fruits of his labor, nonetheless set for himself every day a certain amount of work, and, quote, when his cave was quite blocked up with the products of a whole year's careful work, every year he would put it on fire and burn it. He concludes, by doing this, he showed that a monk cannot remain happily in one place without manual labor, nor ever rise to perfect virtue, so that even when the necessities of life do not demand it, he should perform it simply for the purification of his heart, the control of his thoughts, perseverance in the cell, the arena, and the defeat and overthrow of Asidia itself. End of quote. 
Finally, prayer constitutes the most basic cure of despondency, for man cannot be completely freed from this passion except by the grace of God, which cannot be received except by asking for it through prayer. Without this last remedy, the efficacy of all the others remains incomplete, since they draw all their strength from prayer. For this reason, the fight against the passions, the resistance one offers it, the patience one demonstrates, the hope that one manifests, the mourning, the penthos, catharsis, and tears, remembrance of death, manual labor, all of these must be accompanied by unceasing prayer, which grounds them in God and ensures that these efforts not remain vain and merely human means. Meanwhile, a difficulty arises from the fact that Asidia drives man to abandon prayer and prevents him from having recourse to it. Thus, it is essential that one resist this temptation with all one's might, guarding one's prayer if it has not yet been abandoned, or taking it up again if it has already been lost. The simultaneous practice of prostrations, of matanyas, is especially recommended in the case of despondency and acedia, as it straightway causes the body, which the passion itself numbs, at the same time as the soul, to take part in the prayer, and contributes to drawing both body and soul out of their lethargy. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, recommends, quote, Since you know the cause of this state and whence it derives, return with courage to the place where you usually pray. Prostrate yourself before the God of mercy. With tears and groaning, ask in your heart's grief to be delivered from this weight of acedia and from wicked thoughts. If you strike yourself with force and perseverance, you will obtain in no time your deliverance. From St. Simeon's Practical Gnostic and Theological Chapters. Psalmody appears to be an especially efficacious mode of prayer against acedia, as does the prayer of the heart. When practiced with nepsis, watchfulness, and attentiveness, as St. Diodocus of Photokiv stresses, quote, to avoid this passion which dejects and invenerates us, we must confine the mind within very narrow limits, devoting ourselves solely to the re- remembrance of God, Only in this way will the noose be able to regain its original fervor and escape this senseless dissipation. The victory over Asidia gives man a bit of respite in the spiritual battle, since in a certain way despondency contains within itself all the passions. No passion makes its appearance right away after Asidia has been destroyed. Quote, No other demon follows close on the heels of this one, but only a state of deep peace arises out of this struggle, Notzivagrius. Beyond this rest, the main effect of achieving victory over this passion is an inexpressible joy that fills the soul. Chapter 6. Therapy of Anger, Gentleness, and Patience Since the love of pleasure is one of the fundamental factors behind the pathological use of the irascible power. It is important that one must first uproot it if one wishes to be healed of the passion of anger. Footnote. The question of the therapy of anger was partially studied in Part 4, Chapter 2, Section 3, from the perspective of the therapy of the irascible power in Volume 1, whence the passion of anger directly proceeds. We've shown in particular that the therapy implies a conversion of the irascible part, a conversion consisting in turning it away from the neighbor so as to apply it exclusively against evil, the demons, the passions, and sin, and that a virtuous anger, a righteous indignation, might be substituted for the passion of anger. We will not return to this aspect of conversion here, but we shall look at the therapy of anger and the virtues that are opposed to it from the angle of the relationship with one's neighbor, a point of view not taken into account in the preceding examination. To continue, and since love of pleasure is essentially linked to sensual desires, the therapy of anger presupposes a mortification of strong sexual desire. Thus, St. Maximus notes, 
quote, we lull the inappropriate rantings of aggressiveness, which no longer has concupiscence to excite it and persuade it to allow itself to be conquered by familiar pleasures. Indeed, aggressiveness, which by nature comes to the rescue of sexual desire, naturally ceases to become enraged once it sees that concupiscence has been mortified. From his commentary on the Lord's Prayer. In order for man to be healed of anger, it is necessary that he have conquered the passions connected to concupiscence, especially gluttony, lust, love of money, and the frequent causes of this passion, and that he practice their opposing virtues. The Holy Fathers especially stress the fight against love of money, and thus paradoxically set forth almsgiving as an essential remedy for anger. Evagrius writes, Quote, one must approach the physician of souls who heals the irascible part of the soul through almsgiving from his on various evil thoughts. St. Maximus, who notes, quote, certain things subdue the passions and make them diminish, specifically that for anger, almsgiving is a fitting remedy. Almsgiving heals the soul's insensitive power. Moreover, almsgiving appears as a manifestation of charity, which constitutes one of the main antidotes to anger, since anger, on the contrary, attacks the neighbor and manifests itself as hatred of the latter. Evagrius notes, quote, Charity heals the irascible part of the soul. And he continues, Anger stands more in need of remedies than concupiscence, and for that reason the love that is character, the love that is charity is to be reckoned a great thing, indeed in that it is able to bridle anger. St. Maximus also affirms this. The passions of the soul's of power are more difficult to combat than those of the desiring aspect. Consequently, our Lord has given a stronger remedy against them, the commandment of love. From his four centuries on love. The same father continues, quote, When the desiring aspect of the soul is frequently excited, this failing is cured by kindness, compassion, love, and mercy. Evagrius remarks further that compassion diminishes irascibility and notes almsgiving and meekness dis diminish anger even when it is present. St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches, wherever compassion and love are found, anger and rancor cannot prevail. St. John Climacus, who recommends combining charity with gentleness and patience, clearly states the effectiveness of this remedy. He who has obtained love has bandaged, banished revenge, and a banquet of love dispels hatred. Ladder Step 8. The thinking of rancor, St. Maximus writes similarly, when you have become loving and compassionate toward your neighbor, you will wipe the passion completely from your soul. More generally, he advises, conquer hatred with love. On the other hand, since anger proceeds from pride and vainglory, one can be healed of the former passion by attacking the latter too. St. Maximus, who presents vainglory as one of the reasons why the irascible power is disturbed, stresses the necessity of eliminating this cause of the illness, stating that without despising glory, a man cannot cut off occasions for anger. For his part, St. John the Golden Mouth insists on the etiological role of pride and the necessity of attacking it. Quote, For the illness of the soul, our discourses must fulfill two obligations. First, the healing of the illness. And second, after the healing, the prevention of relapses. Currently, we are seeking a method for a different, difficult course of therapy. It is no longer a question of good health. How to put a stop to this deplorable failing? How to assuage this cruel fever of anger? Behold whence it proceeds, and let us destroy its cause. Whence does it usually come? From an excess of arrogance and pride. Let us eliminate this cause, and the illness will disappear. St. John Chrysostom's homily on Acts. The antidote to vainglory and pride, as we shall see, is formed by humility. In order to be healed of anger, then one must consequently acquire humility. But since anger is a sign of every kind of presumption, as St. John Climacus observes, quote, its conversion requires great humility. Writing further, he notes that 
Humility leads us to banish from ourselves irritation and anger. As with the appearance of light, darkness retreats. So at the, at the fragrance of humility, all anger and bitterness vanquishes, vanishes. St. Gregory of Nyssa, for his part, writes, Humility is the mother of gentleness of heart. If you close the door to pride, anger will find no entrance. Brutality and ignominy provoke this illness in the violent. But this anger does not strike those who practice humility. One must profoundly live out humility of heart. Those who are rooted in this experience provide anger with no opening to their soul. And St. Dorotheus of Gaza recalls these words of an elder, Humility is irritated at no one. From the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Likewise, whoever wishes to find quick healing must not only accept humi humiliations, but also even seek them and strive to endure them to the point of insensitivity. St. John Climacus writes, quote, Freedom from anger is an insatiable appetite for dishonor. Freedom from anger is victory over nature and insensibility to insults. Ladder step eight. From this point of view, the person issuing insults unwittingly takes on the role of a physician of the soul, as an elder observes when he highlights the link between this therapy and the previously mentioned ones of the elimination of pleasure and of love. Quote, if one of your brothers insults you or otherwise grieves you, pray for him as the fathers have said, with the thought that he procures for you great blessings, and that he is a doctor healing you of the love of pleasure. By this your anger will be calmed, since the Holy Fathers, love is anger's bridle. End of quote. The therapeutic power of humility is reinforced when combined with repentance and compunction. St. John Climacus thus teaches that repentance and tears, along with humility, form a threefold cord, and that, quote, the first and paramount property of this excellent and admirable trinity is the acceptance of indignity, with the greatest pleasure when the soul receives it with outstretched hands and welcomes it as something that relieves and cauterizes diseases of the soul and great sins. The second property is the loss of all bad temper and humility at its subsiding. The same saint elsewhere mentions the power that tears of compunction have in reducing anger. Quote from step 25, quote, as the gradual pouring of water on a fire completely extinguishes the flame, so the tears of true mourning are able to quench every flame of anger and irritability. St. Simeon takes up this image, quote, who, being grieved every day, can then continue to live in anger instead of becoming gentle. Indeed, just as water puts out the flames of the hearth, so too grieving and tears extinguish the soul's fury. And this to such an extent that the man for who a long time was given over to such anger can see his irascible soul transformed and attaining to an unshakable calm. Catechesis. Once healing has been accomplished, grieving takes on a preventative role. St. John Climacus observes that anger is held in by tears as by a bridle. St. John Cashin likewise points to the power that compunction has Quote, to eliminate all the turmoil and emotion of anger. In connection with all the above-mentioned remedies, one must clearly associate prayer. St. John Cassian notes that anger, like all the other passions, is healed by interior prayer. In the same vein, St. Nil teaches that prayer is the seed of the absence of anger. Of all the forms of prayer, psalmody has the greatest strength to calm the irascible part of the soul, when the latter has been agitated by anger, St. Basil the Great observes, quote, Psalmody makes the soul serene, procures peace, and calms the tumult and swell of thoughts. It assuages whatever is irritated in the soul and calms what is out of order. From Basil's homily on Psalm 1. On another level, the therapy of anger, understood correctly, consists in striving to abstain from using it against one's neighbor, the person against whom it is instantly turned. This is the first counsel given by St. Dorotheus of Gaza. Was someone angry? Let him be irritated no longer. 
For this, man must be aware that nothing ever justifies anger against one's neighbor. Hence, St. John Cashin writes, quote, The best remedy for this disease is to begin by believing that we are never justified in being angry, whether for a good or a bad reason. End of quote. This accords with the teaching of Christ the Theanthropos himself, who states, quote, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Matthew 5.22 Moreover, the fathers insist on the fact that no potential actions or words of ill will aimed at us by others can in any way justify or explain anger. The cause for anger must be sought exclusively within ourselves. This implies also that we are to seek the means for escaping anger within us rather than expecting them from others. St. Basil remarks, quote, It is not words that wound us, but rather our pride and the good opinion we have of ourselves that revolt us. St. John Cashin also advises, quote, This goal of peaceful improvement cannot be reached through the decisions of others, which is forever beyond our control, but is found rather in our own attitude. To be free from wrath is not dependent on the perfection of others, but stems from our own virtue which is acquired through our own tolerance, not other people's patience. What is more, it bears noting that it is not sufficient to stay away from men who might provoke our anger, for that same passion of anger may be aroused against dumb objects. For this reason, fleeing the company of others cannot be the basis of a legitimate course of therapy, since to do so would allow the underlying case of anger, which is internal, to remain. To no, to no longer become irritated presupposes, first of all, an effort to quell one's irascibility so as to constrain it and to no longer manifest itself. St. Basil counsels, quote, As soon as you feel the first waves, hold it, that is anger, back and subject it to reason as one holds back a horse with a bridle. In the first place, it is fitting to exercise mastery over the acts and words by which anger tends to be expressed. This goal is most easily achieved by striving to keep silence when the attack comes. Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoui recall this teaching from the fathers, quote, The bridle of the irascible part is opportune silence. For his part, St. John Climacus notes, quote, The beginning of freedom from anger is silence of the lips when the heart is agitated. He remarks further, quote, He who is not easily moved to speech cannot be moved to anger. Let us note in passing that silence also constitutes the best attitude one can take vis-a-vis -vis the anger of others, contributing the most to calming it. For more, see St. Basil the Great's Homily 10 on Anger. To continue, however, Holding back anger must not be undertaken solely to avoid its outward manifestations, its expression in word and deed. This bridling must take place above all on the level of thoughts. To the silence of the tongue, one must join, quote, the silence of thoughts. Latter step eight. One must thus put into practice what is recommended in Holy Scripture, quote, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, Leviticus 19.17. For from the heart come forth wicked plans and evil thoughts, Matthew fifteen eighteen and Mark two twenty one, and thence proceed words and deeds. On this level, then, is best is man best able to gain control of the process of anger and avoid its ruinous effects. For this reason, Saint Basil advises, one must smother anger at its birth, not allowing for any manifestation of anger on the level of thoughts, and all the more so on the level of words and actions. It requires constant vigilance. As St. John Cashin teaches, anger is only healed by watchful care. Nipsis. It is essential to cut off the thoughts themselves, not only because they are at the heart of all manifestations of anger, but also because this passion, especially in the form of bitterness, resentment, and rancor, can lead a life exclusively on the interior level. It thus continues to exist and moreover ruins the whole life of the soul, all the more so since it has not been able to express itself outwardly. Thus St. John Cashin teaches, we must not only eliminate anger from our actions, but also eradicate it from our thoughts. The gospel teaches us to cut away the very roots of vice, more than its fruit. 
for they will never grow again once the roots have been torn up. The mind can truly persevere in holiness and patience once this vice has been uprooted from the depths of our hearts, and not just from superficial words and works. The mastery of thoughts seems to be the main therapeutic course in the case where anger takes on the interior form of hatred or rancor. And so far as these forms of anger are linked to offenses one has suffered, the first attitude one must adopt is the forgetting of insults. In other words, forgiveness. St. Maximus considers this forgiveness as one of the basic remedies that immobilize anger and hinder it from becoming aroused and intensified. And this is a constant teaching throughout Holy Scripture. Quote, the roads of those who remember wrongs leads to death. Proverbs 12.28 And you shall not bear grudge against the sons of your own people. Leviticus 19.18 Another remedy must be associated with this one, that of reconciliation with one's neighbor according to what Christ commands. Quote, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going to court. End of quote. Matthew five twenty-three to 25 St. John Chrysostom insists on the therapeutic value of this teaching. Christ, he says, quote, knew that this passion required a quick cure. And just as a skilled physician does not dispense only preventative treatment for illnesses, but also heals them when they have already presented themselves, so too does Jesus Christ do the same. In the same vein, St. John Cassian comments on this same suggestion of the Savior, quote, He who is the physician of souls and the observer of secrets, who wishes to eradicate the seeds of wrath from our hearts, not only commands us to forgive if we are offended and to be reconciled with our brethren, till no memory remain of our grievance or bitterness against them, but he also gives us a similar commandment, if we know of any complaint they have against us, whether justified or not, to leave our gift before the altar, that is, to defer our prayer until we have hurried to offer them amends, and only after receiving our brother's forgiveness to offer the sacrifice of our prayers. End of quote from his Institutes. Chapter 8. After, recon after being, reconciled to being reconciled to other people presupposes that we take responsibility almost always when our neighbor is upset with us. For this reason, it is fitting to blame oneself first of all, and to ask forgiveness from one's brother for having been, for him, a source of irritation. See Dorotheus of Gaza's Instruction 8. Yet renouncing anger and every form with regard to one's neighbor is not sufficient. One must substitute the passion with the corresponding virtue. Now, as the case of the neighbor, the correlative virtue for anger is in the first place gentleness and meekness. St. Dorotheus of Gaza, after counseling, was someone angry. Let him be irritated no longer, adds to this. Quote, let him further acquire gentleness. St. John Chrysostom states succinctly, quote, How do you fight anger? By gentleness. To fight, then, is to be on the opposite side. Since anger and gentleness are antagonistic forces, they are mutually exclusive. Quote, Human nature in every way chooses between two contrary directions, anger or gentleness, observes St. Gregory of Nyssa. Likewise, just as anger drives away gentleness, so gentleness has the power to destroy anger and prevent its rebirth. Quote, gentleness breaks anger, notes St. John Chrysostom. Evagrius stresses in the same vein that, quote, meekness diminishes anger and advises, may the soul curb its irascible part by gentleness. And elsewhere, teach this gentleness to your brothers so that they will return to anger with difficulty. St. John Climacus, for his part, writes, Meekness is a rock overlooking the sea of anger, which breaks all the waves that dash against it, yet remains completely unmoved. Ladder Step 24 Spiritual gentleness has nothing in common with indolence and, or feebleness. It is, not an, it, it is an active, not a passive attitude. Gentleness is a state of stability of soul, of serenity, close to passionlessness, when it reaches its fulfillment. St. John Climacus defines it thus. Meekness 
is an immovable state of soul which remains unaffected, whether in evil rapport or in good rapport, in dishonor or in praise. We see then that this virtue works not only against anger, but also against other passions that can trouble the soul in the context of interpersonal relations. Yet it must be said that it is also a positive virtue with regard to the neighbor, which manifests itself as prayer for him and a general attitude of love in his regard. St. John Climacus states, quote, Meekness consists in praying calmly and sincerely for a neighbor when he causes much turmoil. And he notes further, It is a mark of extreme meekness, even in the presence of one's offender, to be peacefully and lovingly disposed to him in one's heart. Gentleness can be acquired and practiced mainly through prayer. Its other sources are love, of which it is a particular form, fasting, patience, and compunction and tears. Nonetheless, one cannot forget that human efforts alone are not sufficient to acquire this. It is a gift from God, mentioned among the fruits of the Spirit by St. Paul in Galatians 5.22. But this gift can be received only if one seeks it. 1 Timothy 6.11, Colossians 3.12 Gentleness is a remedy not only for anger, but also for all the illnesses of the soul, according to the teaching of Proverbs. Quote, a gentle man is the physician of the heart. Proverbs 14.30 from the Septuagint. To continue. St. John Cashin writes, quote, It uproots not only all the vices of anger, sadness, acedia, vainglory, and pride, but also that of wantonness along with them. Moreover, he stresses the preventative power of this virtue, quote, Whoever is meek and tranquil is not inflamed by the disturbance of anger, nor consumed by the anguish of despondency and sadness, nor distracted by the emptiness of vainglory, nor lifted up by the swelling of pride. End of quote. A contributor to the uprooting of various passions, and first of all anger, from the soul, gentleness, delivers the soul from the turmoil caused by them and guards it against every future turmoil, making it especially invulnerable to every insult and hurtful word. Additionally, gentleness presents a serious obstacle to demonic activity. Andy Vagrius even states that it is the virtue demons fear most to encounter in man. This makes sense, given that anger is an attitude especially characteristic of demons, and one by which man likens himself to them, whereas gentleness, on the contrary, distances man from the demonic state and draws him closer to the angelic one. Contributing to healing man from various passions, gentleness allows man also to attain a multitude of blessings. It is a source of calm and of inner peace and repose. It strengthens the soul, especially in the face of attacks from other people. It gives man confidence, boldness in prayer. It appears above all as a foundation of spiritual discernment, as St. John Climacus notes, quote, The Lord will guide the meek in judgment, or rather in discretion. It is also a source of wisdom. It is written that God teaches the meek his ways and leads the meek in justice. The psalmist continues, Meekness has come upon us and we shall be taught. Psalm 89.10 On this subject, Evagrius writes to one of his correspondents, I am convinced that your meekness has been the cause for you of great knowledge. Indeed, there is no virtue that gives birth to wisdom like this gentleness, by which Moses was praised as being the meekest of men. Gentleness arouses a number of virtues. It is the door, or rather, the mother of love, the buttress of patience, the fellow worker of obedience, a source of chastity, as well as the precursor of all humility, the virtue to which meekness is closely linked and which contributes to establishing it. Gentleness is a source of spiritual joy for the soul, the first fruits of the bliss promised to the meek, according to Christ's word. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Quote, Once the vices have been overcome by the people of Israel, that is, by the virtues struggling against them, patience will lay claim to what wrath has laid hold of. Patience, footnote, 
patience is a particularly rich and multiform virtue, as one will realize in reading the description of St. Kiprianos he gives for it in, on the benefit of patience. Here, too, we shall only examine the virtue insofar as it concerns anger. The Greek fathers used two words to denote patience, most properly translated as forbearance, literally long passion, that is, waiting long before expressing anger, signifies the endurance of insults and moral suffering. Well, another aspect of patience signifies perseverance. In other words, the capacity to follow a work through to the end despite difficulties. This latter term, however, perseverance, also designates patience, properly called. That is, the capacity to wait calmly for what is late in coming. In current usage, the two terms are used equally in both senses. To, the, to return to the text, Dr. Larchet concludes Chapter 6 on the Therapy of Anger. Patience consists in calmly enduring the evils inflicted on us by circumstances or other people. Especially in the case of the latter, this means calmly enduring criticism, outrages, insults, and other harmful words. St. Maximus provides the de this definition for patience. Quote, it consists in remaining constant in adversity, in enduring evils, in withstanding temptation to the end, in not giving in to anger unawares, in not letting a word slip under the sway of emotion, in not bearing suspicion or thinking anything that would be unworthy of a man who fears God. Sedical Discourse 21. And St. John Cassian writes, quote, Everyone knows that patience takes its name from suffering and endurance, and therefore it is clear that no one can be called patient but the person who puts up with everything that is inflicted upon him without indignation. St. John Chrysostom, for his part, remarks, quote, The truly patient man unflinchingly endures the weight of adversity. The patient man is as though in a harbor where he enjoys profound calm. The hurt you cause him will not be able to move this rock. Your outbursts will not be able to shake this tower. The Golden Mouse Homily on 1 Corinthians, chapter 33. The virtue of patience is acquired above all by the love of God, the best model for which being especially Christ, who, quote, was long-suffering when they were ungrateful and blasphemed him, and when they beat him and put him to death, he endured it, imputing no evil at all to anyone. St. Maximus writes, quote, He who has realized love for God in his heart is tireless, as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 16, in his pursuit of the Lord his God and bears every hardship, reproach, and insult nobly, never thinking the least evil of anyone. Patience also comes from love for one's neighbor and above all from humility to such an extent that St. John Cashin states that patience springs from no fount but humility. Patience is one of the virtues that contribute man, most to man's salvation. Christ teaches, quote, by your endurance, you will gain your lives, Luke 21, 19. It appears as a fundamental cure for all the soul's illnesses and not merely for anger. St. John Cassian writes, quote, it is quite evident that the heart's most effective medicine is patience. Moreover, this virtue has an important prophylactic power. Quote, it not only preserves what is good for us, but also defends us from what is contrary to us, notes St. Cyprian. And St. John Chrysostom remarks that it delivers the soul from evil spirits and protects it from the darts they hurl. At the same time that it delivers and protects man from evil, patience is also the source of every good thing for him, contributing in large part to the reestablishment of the health in the soul. Above all, patience provides the soul with the energy it needs to fight and put forth the necessary effort towards spiritual progress. Quote, it gives invincible might, notes St. John Chrysostom in his letter to Olympias. Since it delivers the soul from anger and the turmoil of the other passions, which it also helps in reducing, patience also brings peace and stability to the soul. Correspondingly, it appears as the source of numerous virtues, it contributes especially to the establishment 
of chastity, makes temperance unbending, and also appears as a unifying virtue, establishing and maintaining concord among men, as St. Paul points out, in advising the following. Ephesians 4, 2-3, quote, Forbear one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Finally, from patience comes spiritual consolation and joy. On this topic, St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, When patience grows in our souls, this is the sign that we have secretly received the grace of consolation. The power of patience is stronger than the forms of joy that fall upon the heart. To these virtues of gentleness and patience, the fathers recommend that one add love, which thus appears to be a third virtue opposed to anger. One should note here that there exists a close relationship between love and patience. On the one hand, love implies patience, since the latter is a quality of the former, as St. Paul himself indicates in 1 Corinthians 13.4. Love is patient. Thus, to the question of how love overcomes anger, St. Maximus replies, quote, It is because it is characteristic of love to be merciful and to do good to the neighbor, to be patient in his regard, and to endure all that he makes us undergo. By these means, love overcomes anger in the person who has acquired it. St. Cyprian, commenting on St. Paul's formula, stresses for his part that love can only be maintained firmly on condition that it has been strengthened by patience in every trial. On the other hand, patience presupposes love in order to be virtuous in reality, since, as St. John Chrysostom observes, patience could be a path leading to vengeance and stir up the flame of anger in irritated souls and lead to rancor, which fact allows one to say that patience without generosity is a flaw. This is why the Apostle after saying love is patient, adds that love is kind and not jealous. Elsewhere, he advises, forbear one another in love, Ephesians 4.2. The most direct means to attaining to this love for the neighbor is to pray for him. St. Maximus writes, Has a brother been the occasion of some trial for you, and has you, your resentment led you to hatred? Do not let yourself be overcome by this hatred, but conquer it with love. You will succeed in this by praying to God sincerely for your brother for centuries on love. He counsels further, If you harbor rancor against anybody, pray for him and you will prevent the passion from being aroused. And elsewhere, with regard to rancor, pray for him who has offended you and you will be delivered. As for the nature and effects of love, we shall examine these when this virtue is presented in its entirety. Chapter 7. Therapy of Fear, the Fear of God. Fear in the states that can be connected to it, such as fear, disquiet, anxiety, anguish, and distress, are fundamentally linked to an attachment to sensual goods, as we've seen. Accordingly, man can only be healed of this fear by detaching himself from this world, and by turning every care of his over to God in the firm hope that in his providence the Lord will provide for all his needs. This is what Christ himself teaches. Quote, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. Matthew six thirty one to thirty four. Saint Isaac counsels from this perspective. Quote, if you believe that God keeps you in His providence, why get unsettled and worry about passing things and the needs of the flesh? Cast your care on the Lord, and He will nourish you. No threat will frighten you any longer. Seneca Homily five. And draw near, he says. Hope in Me, and you will have rest from every work and from every fear. As we've seen, the first source of fear is a lack of faith. Correspondingly, fear is abolished in the heart of man inasmuch as he has faith in God. An unbending faith, notes Evagrius, completely bars access to fear. Whoever firmly believes in God and in his providence is certain that he will receive help and protection from him in every circumstance and henceforth no longer needs fear 
to, f to fear either circumstances or any kind of adversary or even death itself. St. Paul recalls that God himself has said, quote, I will never fail you nor forsake you. Hence, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Hebrews 13, verse 5, and Psalm 26, 1. And the psalmist notes, quote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the protector of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. And do not be afraid of sudden panic or of the attacks of the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalm 22, 4. It is not faith itself that delivers man from fear, but rather God, who in response to this faith bestows his aid and succor upon man. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, When his heart fears and trembles beyond all serenity, let man thus understand and know that this fear of the heart points out and reveals that he really needs someone else to help him. It is said that only the help of God is saving. Seneca Homily 21. Man must ask for this help in prayer, in the belief that God is able to grant it to him, and in the hope that he will indeed bestow it upon him. Let us note here that the Jesus prayer, which works against fear and all its proximate passions, disquiet, fear, anxiety, anguish, it's the most effective remedy. St. John Climacus advises, quote, Flog your enemies with the name of Jesus, for there is no stronger weapon in heaven or earth. When you get rid of the disease of fear, praise him who has delivered you. If you continue to be thankful, he will protect you forever. Step 21. And Evagoras notes, crashing sounds and roars and voices and beatings, all of these coming from the devil's are heard by the man who pursues the practice of pure prayer. Yet he does not lose courage or his presence of mind. He calls out to God, I shall fear no evils, for you are with me. And he adds other similar prayers. Elsewhere, the same author observes, For the man whose mind is always directed toward God, whose irascible part is full of the remembrance of God, and whose desire to aspect completely yearns for him, it is completely natural not to fear those who prowl around our bodies, to wit, the rebellious enemies. End of quote. Indeed, the prayer of the heart allows man to be continuously united to God and to benefit constantly from his aid. Henceforth, no cause of fear can come upon him any longer unawares. An elder used to say, whether you be asleep or awake, whatever you do, if God is before your eyes, the enemy cannot frighten you. If your thought abides in God, God's strength will abide also in you. The more man's prayer is pure, the less he knows fear. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, The sign that one has touched on pure prayer is no longer to be troubled, even if the entire world were to array itself against us. The disappearance of fear and its Concomitant passions derives here from the continual presence of divine power in man, thanks to the prayer that is itself continual. Yet man can also be delivered from these passions through a specific prayer. Thus St. John the Solitary writes, quote, Through the request was made to Christ, we can receive strength and succor against our anguish. In a saying relates that <clears throat> Abba Theodore was asked, if a catastrophe suddenly arose, would you be afraid, Abba? The elder replied, Even if the heavens and earth collided, Theodore would not be afraid. He had asked God in truth to take fear away from him. Correlatively, the therapy of fear presupposes man's renunciation of his own will, as well as an attitude of humility. Thus to a brother who had asked him, well, Tell me how I can be saved at this time for a thought of disquiet has arisen in my heart. St. Barsanufius responds to him, At every moment, if a man can completely cut off his own will and keep a humble heart, he can be saved by the grace of God, and no matter where he be, disquiet will not seize him. As we've seen, fears connected also to pride, 
and in so much as man puts his confidence in his own strength, he's subject to this passion. In order to be healed, in order to be able to conquer fear by virtue of God's own might, in order to be able to receive this might and preserve it, man must deny himself and recognize his own powerlessness. Otherwise, the divine energy will find no place in him. St. Isaac also recommends to the person wishing to be freed from fear to pray above all for humility. The more he prays, the more his heart becomes humble. When man has humbled himself, immediately compassion surrounds him, and the heart thus senses divine aid. It discovers that a power is arising within it, the power of confidence. End quote from Ascetical Homily 21. Man can likewise conquer fear through love, which excludes fear, according to the words of the Apostle St. John. Quote, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4.18 Having observed that as love wanes, fear appears, St. John Climacus follows St. John in teaching that he who has no fear is filled with love. This is true for love of one's neighbor. Whoever loves his brother no longer fears him. But on a more basic level, this teaching concerns the love of God, which excludes all forms of earthly fear, especially the fear of death that lies at the heart of those other forms. In the love of God, man receives the power of confidence that triumphs over every fear. He is united to him to whom all things are subject, and nothing can harm him. Through love, man lives henceforth in close intimacy with God, away from all the things of this world, whether external or internal, that are able to incite fear, and delights in the spiritual blessings that can never be taken from him. St. Barsanufius notes, quote, As long as you are among men, expect tribulations, perils, and spiritual assaults. But when you have attained to what, have, what has been prepared for you, you will be without fear. Meanwhile, we must stress that if man must strive to be healed of the passion of fear, nonetheless he must not reject every fear of his soul, for not every fear is a passion. As we have seen, there exists a virtuous fear that God has given man as a means of salvation, and which the fathers for this reason call salvific fear or salvific anxiety and other similar expressions. This fear constitutes what the ascetic tradition calls the fear of God. Passionate fear must disappear so as to give way to this virtuous fear. The two forms of fear are indeed based on the same natural tendency of man to fear, but in the first instance, this tendency is applied to this world rather than to God, as once was nature's want. For man, it is a matter of converting and turning his fear back toward God, since these two fears are based on the same tendency, they are mutually exclusive. Passionate fear excludes the fear of God, but this virtuous fear, once acquired, banishes the passionate kind. For this reason, one of the basic remedies of the passion of fear is the fear of God, which to the extent that it grows within man reduces this passion and takes its place. Thus, Sirach advises, quote, He who fears the Lord will not be timid, nor play the coward, Sirach 34, 14. St. John Climacus, calling to mind the fear of God, writes, This fear banishes every other fear. The same father continues, quote, He who has become the servant of the Lord will fear his master alone, but he who does not yet fear him is often afraid of his own shadow. Abba Serpion notes that if man is attentive to God and fear at every hour, he can fear nothing from the enemy. St. Simeon, the new theologian, for his part, observes, quote, Whoever fears God does not dread the attacks of the demons or their impotent assaults, impotent assaults, or even the threats of the wicked. <clears throat> In many respects, the fear of God can be considered to be a basic virtue. The allusions to this virtue are frequent in the Holy Scriptures and the fathers present its possession as a condition for salvation. St. John Cassian writes, As Scripture says, the first stage of our salvation and our wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1.7 And St. Barsanufius says, 
if we do not bear witness in our deeds to the remembrance of the fear of God and the compunction resulting from it, we shall be condemned. For his part, St. Isaac states, the beginning of man's true life is the fear of God. The Sadical Homily number one. There are two forms, however, of the fear of God, corresponding to two degrees of this virtue. A, the first form results from the fear of divine judgment, whether current or future. Footnote from the Sayings of the Desert alphabetical series, Desert Fathers, Elias. Abba Elias said, As for me, I fear three things. The moment when my soul will leave my body, when I shall have to appear before God, and when the sentence will be pronounced against me. To return, whether current or future, and the sufferings that might result from such judgment, which the fathers often term chastisement. Elsewhere, we have shown that we must not understand by this term the punishment inflicted by a cruel and vengeful God on those who have transgressed his law, but rather the internal sufferings linked to the state of being separated from God and being deprived of spiritual goods to which man has condemned himself through his own sin. Divine judgment only reveals the full extent of this inner suffering. This first form of fear is the initial fear, which beginners know. Thus it is written, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The Holy Fathers note three reasons that can turn man away from evil and attach him to God. The fear of chastisement, the hope for future good things, and the love of God. The first two belong properly to those who are tending toward perfection, but are still slaves, while the third characterizes the perfect, quote, those who have received in themselves the image and likeness of God, and who are no longer slaves but his friends and sons, Galatians 4, 7. St. John Cassian writes, quote, If a person is tending to perfection, then he will mount from that first degree of fear, which we have properly designated as servile, to the higher level of hope, progressing by a degree to the degree of love. Hence, we must strive to mount in perfect ardor of mind from this fear to hope and from hope to love of God and the love of virtue itself. We see that when the fathers state that this first form of fear belongs to beginners, they understand by this term those who have not yet attained perfection and who are not yet saints. Thus, this fear can and even must be experienced by those who are advanced spiritually. St. Dorotheus of Gaza does not hesitate to say to his monks, this initial fear is ours. However, this fear is called to be abolished and surpassed in the perfection of love, as the Apostle St. John teaches, quote, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and he who fears is not perfected in love. 1 John 4.18 St. Maximus, taking his lead, writes, The first kind of fear is expelled by perfect love when the soul has acquired this and is no longer afraid of punishment. Thus St. Anthony the Great can say, Henceforth I no longer fear God, I love him, for love chases away fear. Yet we must note that only perfect love, as the Apostle St. John and the Fathers intentionally stress, makes this fear obsolete, inasmuch as man has not been totally purified of his passions, insofar as he has not acquired dispassion and has not attained the perfection of love, such fear maintains and been, remains valuable to them. St. Diarchos of Photiki writes very clearly, quote, The fear which characterizes those who are still being purified is accompanied by a moderate measure of love, but perfect love is found in those who have already been purified and in whom there is no longer any fear, for perfect love casts out fear. For this reason, Holy Scripture says in one place, O fear the Lord, all you who are his saints. And in another, O love the Lord, all you who are his saints. Psalms 33 and 30. From this we see clearly that the righteous who are still in the process of being purified 
are characterized both by fear and by a moderate measure of love. Perfect love, on the other hand, is found only in those who have already been purified and in whom there is no longer any thought of fear, but rather a constant burning and binding of the soul to God through the energy of the Holy Spirit. If fear must remain so long as love has not yet attained to perfection, it is because in large part it contributes to purifying man and causing him to obtain the dispassion that serves as a condition for this perfection, so much so that one can say that without first acquiring this fear, such acquisition itself presupposing moreover a certain perfection, man cannot attain to perfect love. St. Isaac states this categorically, seeing in the sphere the driving force behind and the guide to repentance, the primary organ of the purification of the soul. Quote, Just as, as it is impossible to traverse the great seas without a vessel, so too can no one achieve love without fear. We can only cross the sickness-inducing sea, separating us from spiritual paradise on the ship of repentance propelled by the oarsmen of fear. But if these oarsmen of fear do not command the ship of repentance by which we traverse the sea of this world on the way to God, we shall be engulfed in the nauseating waters. Repentance is the ship, fear is its pilot, and love is the divine port. End of quote. St. Isaac the Syrian Ascetical Homily 72. To continue, for his part, St. Maximus the Confessor notes, quote, Through such fear we develop dispassion, and it is from dispassion that love comes. And here again, St. Diodocus of Photosy writes quite clearly, No one can love God consciously in his heart unless he has first feared him with all his heart. Through the action of fear, the soul is purified, and as it were, made malleable, and so it becomes awakened to the action of love. No one, however, can come to fear God completely in the way described, unless he first transcends all worldly cares. For when the noose reaches a state of deep stillness and detachment, then the fear of God begins to trouble it, purifying it with full perception from all gross and cloddish density thereby bringing it to a great love for God's goodness. From On Spiritual Knowledge and Discernment, Chapter 16. St. Gregory Palamas likewise underscores the indispensable pedagogical and purif purifying role of fear, seeing in this the source and prerequisite for accessing love, and thus the very contemplation and theoria of God. Quote, the education that purifies the soul has as its source the fear of God, which causes continual prayer to God in compunction and in fulfillment of the gospel commandments to be born. Once reconciliation has been reestablished through prayer and the fulfillment of the, the holy commandments, fear turns into love, and the pain of prayer transformed into joy causes the flower of illumination to appear. End of quote triads. St. Isaac of the Syrian also teaches that fear is the condition sine qua non for the perfection of the virtuous life, love, and the knowledge of God, and thus forms the spiritual path which all who desire to attain this goal must tread. Quote, spiritual knowledge naturally follows on the work of the virtues, but fear and love proceed from one another, and fear itself precedes love. Whoever impudently states that it is possible to acquire the latter before laboring for the former is laying the foundation for his soul's ruin. For such is the path of the Savior. The work of the virtues and spiritual knowledge are born of fear and love. B. The second form of fear is inherent to perfect love. It follows on the love of God, whereas the first kind of fear was banished by this. It is the fear of being separated or distance from God, the fear of being deprived of the intimate communion of love. As Clement of Alexandria quite rightly says, what one fears in this is not God, but being separated from God. St. Dorotheus explains, 
Whoever possesses true love, perfect love, as St. John says, is born by this love to perfect fear, for he fears and keeps the will of God, because having tasted the sweetness of being with God, as we have said, he dreads losing it and being deprived of it. Instruction number four. St. John Cashin describes this fear at great length, citing the scriptural passages in which it is mentioned, quote, whoever, therefore, has been established in the perfection of this love will certainly mount by a degree of excellence to the more sublime fear of love, which is begotten not by dread of punishment or by desire for rewards, but by the greatness of one's love. It is with this anxious disposition that a son fears his very indolent, indulgent father, or a brother his brother, or a friend his friend, or a wife her husband, inasmuch as they are afraid not of blows or of insults, but of the slightest offense against love. And so they are always preoccupied with a concerned devotion, not only in every action, but also in every word, lest the ardor of one of the other's love for them become to the slightest extent lukewarm. This second form of fear thus appears to be perfect fear, that of the saints who have attained the perfection and summit of holy love, the saints, notes St. Dorotheus of Gaza, no longer fulfill the will of God out of fear of punishment, but out of love, fearing lest they do something contrary to the will of him whom they love. The saints no longer act out of fear, but fear through love. St. John Cassian also notes, quote, As the psalmist says, it is not sinners, but holy persons who are urged to this fear by the prophetic words, quote, Fear the Lord all his holy ones, for nothing is lacking to those who fear him. Psalm 33.10 For it is certain that nothing is lacking to the perfection of one who fears God with this fear. When the prophet was describing the sevenfold spirit that without a doubt came down upon the Lord in human form, according to the plan of the incarnation, he said concerning this fear, quote, The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom, and understanding, a spirit of counsel and fortitude, a spirit of knowledge and piety. Isaiah 11.2 Lastly, as if referring to something special, he says, And a spirit of fear of the Lord shall fill him. Isaiah 11.3 It should first be carefully noted that he did not say, And a spirit of fear of the Lord shall rest upon him as he did when speaking of the others, but rather a spirit of fear of the Lord shall fill him. For so overwhelming is it that it lays hold not of part of the mind, but of all of it, and the person whom it has once possessed by its power. Not without reason, since it clings to that love which never fails. It not only fills, but also possesses everlastingly and inseparably the person whom it has seized. This, then, is the perfect fear with which the Lord in human form, who came not only to redeem the human race, but also to offer a way of perfection and an example of virtue, is said to have been fulfilled. Nonetheless, St. Dorotheus insists on the fact that no one can attain this perfect fear without previously known the first form of fear. Quote, it is impossible to attain to perfect fear without passing through the initial fear. For it is said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and again, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It is also fitting for the person who has not yet attained either health in impassibility or perfection in love to seek to acquire this initial fear. For contrary to the passion of fear, the fear of God does not arise spontaneously within man, but is a virtue he must strive to acquire by God's help. Moreover, this is why this fear is the object of a commandment. Quote, fear God, for this is the duty of all men. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 12. And conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. 1 Peter 1, 17. Man cannot make any progress whatsoever on the road of praxis without being continually equipped with this inner disposition, as St. Parsonufius states 
with the following image. Quote, when someone undertakes a voyage, he straps on his sandals. The material preparation must lead us to think of the spiritual preparation. One must put on the spiritual sandals, that is, the preparation of the fear of God. One must remember that all must be accomplished according to the fear of God. What are the conditions for the acquisition of the fear of God? Such fear proceeds from faith, and yet it is also directly linked to the practicing of the commandments. As the psalmist points out, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. And the preacher writes, Fear God and keep his commandments. To such an extent do the Holy Fathers understand by fear of God the very keeping of the commandments. For man only manifests that he truly possesses this virtue by conforming himself to God's will, as expressed in the commandments. Thus, the demons also fear God, but with a fear that is not virtuous, since even if it contains the recognition of God's omnipotence, it nonetheless lacks the fulfilling of his will. Detachment from this world and spiritual lack of concern for earthly things are another condition of godly fear. The remembrance of death and the end of all things, as well as solitude, all of which are closely linked to the foregoing attitudes, likewise favor this virtue, as do the following. The regular examining of one's conscience, the recognition of one's sinful state, mourning and tears. The fathers also recommend to those who seek to acquire this virtue the diligent visitation of a spiritual guide who already possesses it. However, we cannot forget that inasmuch as it is a virtue, the fear of God is a manifestation of grace. And if man's efforts are absolutely essential for acquiring it, nonetheless it will always remain a gift from God and must accordingly be asked of him through prayer. It is mainly by prayer that man can receive the purification, allowing him to feel the fear of God, a, f a fear he is incapable of experiencing even on its most basic levels as long as he is totally subject to the passions. For this reason, even the initial fear presupposes a certain amount of spiritual development and thus appears as a virtue possessed not by beginners in the strict sense of the word, but rather by those who are making progress. St. Diodocus of Photiki, employing explicitly medical language, writes, quote, If wounds in the body have been neglected and left unattended, they do not react to medicine when the doctors apply it to them. But if they have first been cleansed, then they respond to the action of the medicine and, and so are quickly healed. In the same way, if the soul is neglected and wholly covered with the leprosy of self-indulgence, it cannot experience the fear of God, however persistently it is warned of the terror and power of God's judgment. When, however, through great attentiveness the soul begins to be purified, it also begins to experience the fear of God as a life-giving medicine, which, through the reproaches it arouses in the conscience, burns the soul in the fire of dispassion. The effects of the fear of God. Footnote, in what follows we shall essentially be examining the effects of the first form of prayer, since the second one goes beyond the context of praxis. The effects of the fear of God are especially numerous and important insofar as this virtue is one of the foundations and conditions for the spiritual life, so much so that St. John Chrysostom states, quote, You have a treasure greater than all riches, the fear of God. First of all, this fear turns man away from evil, as Solomon teaches. Proverbs 15, 12. It purifies man of every sin and passion, and for this reason appears as a universal cure. St. John Cashin considers it to be the cross on which the ascetic must die to the world. And St. Diodocus of Photiki, stressing its therapeutic value, notes, quote, As a life-giving medicine, it burns the soul. Through its reproaches, it arouses. After this, the soul 
is gradually cleansed until it is completely purified. St. Gregory Palama sees in it the source of the education that purifies the soul, which rids it of everything and polishes it so as to make it like a tablet, ready to receive the gifts of the Spirit. Triads, chapter 1. The therapeutic action of the fear of God is revealed to be especially effective against the passions that numb the soul and paralyze spiritual life. Negligence, despondency, acedia. Nothing else is so effective in dispelling despondency, teaches St. John Climacus. The other passions of forgetfulness, neglect, cowardice, weariness, and hardness of heart in the ascetical sense of spiritual insensitivity. It likewise purifies the soul of all carnal desires and all wicked thoughts and imaginings. Yet while eliminating all these things from the soul, it keeps man safe from their return. St. Basil writes, quote, Fear inhibits every passionate suggestion. Where the fear of God is found, all defilements of passion are expelled from our thinking. St. John Chrysostom likewise underscores this prophylactic function. Quote, Where there is fear, wicked desires are suppressed. The disordered passions are banished, and just as when a house is continually guarded by a troop of soldiers and no brigand or assassin or any other miscreant dares approach it, so too, when fear seizes our souls, no dishonorable passion enters in with ease. All take to flight and withdrawal, driven away on all sides by the pressing might of salvific fear. End of quote from On the Statutes. Fear also distances the soul from every worldly care and preoccupation. Fear thus contributes to the essential work of guarding the heart, a prerequisite for pure prayer, perfect love, and the true contemplation of God. Origen goes so far as to write, quote, Nothing guards our hearts like the fear of God. And St. Barsanufius calls to mind the perfect who are capable of guiding their mind and keeping it in the fear of God, lest it drift away and be engulfed by deep distractions or fantasies. Sedical Homily 1. The fear of God not only drives the passions from our heart, but also introduces therein all the virtues. Abba James teaches, quote, Just as a lamp illumines a dark room, so too the fear of God, when it penetrates the heart of man, enlightens him and teaches him all the virtues. And St. John Chrysostom states, Nothing causes virtue to grow and flourish as much as does the sentiment of continual fear. The fear of God appears as the prerequisite and source of all virtuous life, preceding the work of the virtues and giving birth to them. Thus it is impossible to acquire any of them without this fear, as St. Isaac the Syrian states very clearly in Ascetical Homily 44. St. John Chrysostom, the Golden Mouth teaches the same, one is also far from doing good when this feeling of fear is not felt, and likewise far from doing evil when one feels it. Godly fear allows man to attain the good insofar as it turns him away from evil and purifies him of it, as St. Paul explicitly points out when he advises, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7.1 Yet, speaking in a more positive sense, holy fear does this inasmuch as it encourages the keeping of the commandments. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, says the psalmist. But why does he say this? Taking up the rest of the psalm, St. Basil replies, because he applies himself with zeal to the observing of his commandments. For those who live in fear will not be able to omit or observe negligently a single one of the commandments that has been given to them. From Basil the Great's long rule, the fear of God strengthens the faith, whence it proceeds and went, which lies at the very heart of the spiritual life. Combined with this faith, such fear gives man the power to undertake everything, even what appears to be difficult or, or impossible to most people. It makes him firm and resolute on his path, fortifies his heart, and this is all the more the case since this fear gives him an unshakable confidence in God. From this fact, 
man receives great inner stability through such fear vis-a-vis the torments of this life, as well as the enemies he must confront on the spiritual path, whereas on the contrary, he is all the more dominated by change and abandonment the more he has deserted fear. If it is encouraged by repentance, compunction, and tears, fear again appears as a source of penitential attitudes and a factor that develops and reinforces them. Fear promotes prayer and makes it fervent, rendering prayers of request fertile. St. Barsanufius writes, quote, It is a great joy that someone asks for something with the fear of God. He is assured that his prayer shall be heard. Yet from fear also proceeds the prayer of praise. Thus it is written, Praise our God, all you who fear him. Revelation 19.5 And fear God and give him glory. Revelation 14.7 This is also the fear that, quote, causes continual prayer to God to be born in compunction and the fulfillment of the gospel commandments, as St. Gregory Palamas notes. It contributes to making every form of prayer pure insofar as it engenders sobriety in the soul. The fear of God appears especially as a basic source of humility to such an extent that a brother who had asked, How does a man arrive at humility? Abacronius responds through the fear of God. But as we have previously seen, such fear leads man above all to love, the crown of all the virtues. Spiritual knowledge proceeds from the purification of the passions. Dispassion and the correlatively to keeping the commandments and the life led according to the virtues, at the summit of which stands love. Additionally, the fear of God appears indirectly to be an absolutely necessary prerequisite and source for this knowledge, in particular of this first degree, namely wisdom. For this reason, it is said several times in the Holy Scripture, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the psalmist says further, a good understanding have all those who practice it. From this perspective, St. John Chrysostom states categorically, quote, whoever is virtuous and fears God is the wisest of men. And again, whoever fears God possesses wisdom. St. Gregory Palamas sees in the fear of God the source not only of divine wisdom, but also of divine contemplation. And St. Isaac the Syrian clearly points out the process by which fear leads to knowledge. Quote, From faith is born the fear of God. Now when such fear accompanies works and is raised, however slightly, toward fulfillment, it engenders spiritual knowledge. Faith arouses fear in us, and fear drives us to repent and set ourselves to task. Thus spiritual knowledge is given to man, knowledge that is the sensation of mysteries, knowledge that engenders the faith of true contemplation. However, spiritual knowledge is not thus simply born of pure faith alone, but faith also engenders the fear of God. And in the fear of God, once we begin to act through it, spiritual knowledge is born of the energy of this fear. As St. John Chrysostom has said, quote, When someone acquires the will to follow the fear of God and right wisdom, he quickly receives the revelation of mysteries. And St. John Cassian he stresses that the fear of God is necessary not only in order to acquire knowledge, but also to preserve it. Quote, One of the prophets neatly expressed the grandeur of this fear when he said, Wisdom and knowledge are the riches of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. He could not express more clearly the dignity and the worth of this fear than by saying, that the riches of our salvation, which consist in true wisdom and in the knowledge of God, cannot be preserved except by the fear of the Lord. Of course, spiritual knowledge is not the fruit of the fear of God itself, but appears as a free gift of God in response to man's prayer and ascetical efforts, work in which prayer plays a crucial role, as we've seen. For this reason, St. Isaac the Syrian takes pains to, to state specifically Quote, it is not the fear of God that gives birth to this spiritual knowledge, but this knowledge is offered as a gift, as soon as the fear of God gets down to work. Sedical Homily 18. The preceding observations allow us yet again to understand why the fathers consider the fear of God to be a source of spiritual joy for man, 
Following the psalmist who says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, St. John Chrysostom states, Only he who fears the Lord is happy in his baptismal catechesis. Whoever fears the Lord delights in true and solid happiness, and true happiness lies in the fear of the Lord. From St. John Chrysostom's Commentary on Psalms. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8. Therapy of Vainglory and Pride. Humility. 1. Therapy of Vainglory. In describing vainglory, we see that it is particularly a subtle passion, difficult to recognize, able to take on multiple forms and to attack man from many angles, such that St. John Climacus considers it as, quote, the most difficult and most dangerous of all snares. The therapy of this spiritual illness thus proves itself from the outset to be especially delicate, all the more so, since this illness feeds on the very efforts made to combat it, and is found to be strengthened by its defeat, as St. John Cashin explains, quote, all other vices dwindle as we overcome them, and day by day become weaker in defeat, but vainglory rises again from defeat, more eager for the fight. And we think it, it, it's extinct, it recovers from its death, all the more lively. Other types of vice normally only attack those who they might defeat, whereas this one presses hardest on its conquerors. The more successful we elude it, the harder it assaults us through our very joy and victory. End of quote from Institutes. Thus, vainglory, quote, is far more dangerously deceptive to the unwary warrior. Whoever undertakes the therapy of vainglory, then, will have to employ great spiritual discernment and constant watchfulness from start to finish. The fathers judge it necessary to put at the disposal of those who come to be instructed by them a detailed knowledge of the passions, its multifaceted character, its turns and traps, but also the meaning of foiling it ru its ruses. All this forms from the outset a fundamental component of both the preventative care as well as the therapy. As St. John Cashin stresses, quote, like skillful doctors who do not only treat existing diseases but know how to prevent future ones and to take precautions with wise advice and medicine, in the same way these true doctors of the soul treat the emerging diseases of the heart in advance with their spiritual teaching like a heavenly antidote and do not allow them to grow in the minds of the young ones, instructing them both in the causes of their present temptations and the means to cure them. End of quote. And the fathers without exception put themselves up as examples and frankly admit and confess all their struggles against vice whether suffered now or once suffered when they were younger, as if they were enduring them now, so that as they reveal how they have been deceived by all their own temptations, the younger monks who are listening to them may know the secrets of their struggles, and considering them may learn as in a mirror both the origins of the vices that trouble them and their cure, thus instructed before the event about future problems, they can explain how to anticipate them, confront them, and defeat them. End of quote, all from John Cashin's Institutes, chapter 11. To continue, man will be spurred on to fight this passion if he is aware of the risks it forces him to run. In particular, the total loss of the benefit of the sufferings endured thus far, as well as all the virtues he had been able to acquire, finding himself in the end reduced to nothing. As the psalmist says, God scattered the bones of men pleasers. Psalm 52, 6. For this reason, meditation on and the fear of divine judgment at the present time and in the future contribute to this battle. Such judgment especially reveals to us this word of Christ's, quote, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 14, 11. Since vainglory is the quest for glory of a human, mundane, and earthly character, the man wishing to conquer this passion, must recognize the vanity of such glory by becoming aware that it, its foundation lacks substance and the goals it pursues are not, as the Holy Fathers repeatedly underscore. Death, 
reveals the full extent of the vanity and emptiness of the human things vainglory has in sight, while at the same time it is the crucial moment in which divine judgment is disclosed to man. This is why the remembrance of death is also an effective weapon against this passion. Since vainglory is also the quest for respect, renown, honor, and glory, it is fitting to renounce everything that can be of source or occasion for it. One must flee the company of those who are obviously under its sway and give a deadly example. One must refuse every function honored by men, especially on account of the power or prestige it confers. One must push away every distinction capable of attracting admiration or praise. As vainglory is the desire to be noticed, it is even fitting to avoid what can call attention to us, whether in word or deed or behavior. On the contrary, whoever wants to be delivered from vainglory must do everything to become or remain unknown by men, opting for a life in obscurity as well as seeking out solitude can contribute to this. We have seen that vainglory consists in being puffed up, not on account of worldly goods, but also on account of spiritual ones, of glorifying oneself before others on account of one's ascases and virtues. Herein lies the subtlest and the most formidable form of the passion, which never ceases to threaten the spiritual man it must be fought in a variety of ways, with regard to other people for whom vainglory expects praise and admiration. It is fitting not to allow anything to be seen of one's ascases or the virtues one possesses, nor of the acts manifesting them. In this sense, in Maximus writes, quote, self-esteem is eradicated by the hidden practice of the virtues. And likewise elsewhere, it is no small struggle to be freed from self-esteem. Such freedom is to be attained by the inner practice of the virtues. By carefully controlling one's behavior and speech, one must keep watch, lest anything of one's inner state become visible, and anything of one's spiritual life be revealed. For this reason, St. John Climacus advises, quote, Be zealous within your soul, without showing it in the least outwardly, either by visible sign or by word or by a hint, and hide your manner of life wherever you go. From ladder, step four, a nine, to continue. Elsewhere, he writes, the beginning of freedom from vainglory is the custody of the mouth. This implies even more so the refusal to teach others, or even speak a word, as St. Macarius the Great stresses, Quote, whoever is asked to speak and whom one constrains to give a word must be grieved at this. He must flee the thing as he would fire and repel the thought of it in order to escape and not fall into vainglory on account of his word. End of quote. The saint also cites the example of Moses, who being asked by God himself to proclaim the word to Israel, excused himself, saying, I am not eloquent. Exodus 4.10 the example of Jeremiah, who likewise accused himself by saying, Behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. Jeremiah 1.6 And that of St. Paul, who writes of his ministry, Necessity is laid upon me. 1 Corinthians 9.17 In the sayings of the Desert Fathers, numerous examples are found of fathers who thus refuse to speak, responding to the questions of those who have come to inquire of them only after the latter, have insisted for quite some time. Whoever wishes to conquer vainglory must only not only hide his potential, ascases, virtues, and wisdom, but must also not hide his faults from others, on condition that this does not cause them harm. From this point of view, St. John Climacus counsels, quote, do not hide your shameful deeds with the idea of removing a cause of stumbling for your neighbor, although perhaps it will not be advisable to use this remedy in every case, but will depend on the nature of one's sins. Speaking generally, this is a, a basic remedy against vainglory. Man must accept to be humbled and even seek out what is able to bring him disdain. Quote, the beginning of freedom from vainglory is love of being dishonored, writes St. John Climacus. An elder also advises, if the devil comes to lead you astray into vainglory, do something or take on some bearing before men such that they despise you. 
For know this well, Satan is never as sad as when man desires humiliation and scorn. From the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And St. John Climacus notes that God rejoices when he sees us running to meet dishonor so as to crush, strike, and destroy our vain self-esteem. The same saint reveals that certain elders or spiritual fathers are, are led to humble those who do not humble themselves with the aim of healing them of vainglory. Quote, when their physician noticed that some liked to display themselves before people of the world who were visiting the holy monastery, then in the presence of such visitors, he subjected them to extreme insults and gave them the most humiliating tasks. Ladder, step 25. Moreover, humiliation may also be used to the same end by God himself, as St. John Climacus further notes. The Lord often brings the vainglorious to a state free of vainglory through the dishonor that befalls them. Man must also see in the various humiliations he undergoes, scorn, insults, and so on, providential remedies, and he must view whoever grieves, wrongs, despises, or insults him as a physician who has revealed to him his illness and has provided him with the means to be healed of vainglory. Thus a holy father advises, quote, If someone keeps the memory of a brother who has grieved, wrong, or insulted him, he must remember him as a physician sent by Christ and consider him as a benefactor. For if you are grieved in these circumstances, it is because your soul is sick. Indeed, if you were not ill, you would not be suffering. You must then give thanks to this brother because thanks to him, you know your illness. You must pray for him and receive what comes from him as remedies sent you by the Lord. On the contrary, if you are angry with him, it is as though you were saying to Jesus, quote, I do not wish to receive your cure. I prefer the gangrene to fester in my wounds. This is from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And further on, quote, If you wish to be healed of these terrible wounds of the soul, you must bear what the physician imposes on you. In truth, whoever is sick in body does not undergo an amputation or take a purgative with pleasure. He even retains a bad memory of it. Yet persuaded that without this treatment he cannot be delivered from his illness, he endures whatever the physician imposes on him. He knows that by means of a small inconvenience he'll be delivered from a lengthy illness. The cautery of Jesus is whoever delivers you from vainglory by insulting you or wronging you. The same Holy Father says regarding himself, I do not accuse those who reproach me, but I name them my benefactors and do not reject the physicians of souls who gives a dishonoring remedy to my proud and impure soul. The sign that a man has been healed of vainglory is that he no longer experiences sorrow at being humiliated in public, nor does he any longer feel rancor towards whoever has offended, despised, or insulted him, or toward the person who has spoken or continues to speak ill of him. On the contrary, he thanks him as being a benefactor, following the example of the above-mentioned elder. From this perspective, one can understand St. Maximus's statement that love for our neighbor makes us scorn fame. Taking on and even seeking out humiliations heals man of vainglory inasmuch as this passion seeks after worldly glory and the admiration or at least the respect of others. But vainglory is also a passion by which man holds himself in high esteem, admires himself, honors himself, glorifying himself in his own eyes. In order to fight the passion on this level, man must first of all be ignorant of his own ascases and virtues. He must hide from his own eyes what is good in him and what good he has done. St. John Chrysostom notes that Christ, quote, after Criticizing vanity gives the remedy to a soul stricken by this sin by commanding, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6 3. Even if he should have fulfilled all God's will, man should consider himself, as Christ recommends, also in Luke 17 10, as a useless servant who has done nothing more than what was required of him. Here, too, we see a means given by the Holy Father for avoiding vainglory. 
But even before this, man must examine his conscience and consider how he is far from having fulfilled all the commandments. And even before this, he must recall his sins and weep over them, which will cut short vain glory, both with respect to himself as well as to others. St. John the Golden Mouth remarks, If we do not lose sight of our sins, external goods will never be able to puff up our souls. Riches, power, great rank, dignities, honors, they will have no influence over us. And St. John Climacus advises, when our praisers begin to praise us, let us briefly call to mind the multitude of our sins, and we shall find ourselves unworthy of what is said or done in our honor. Finally, let us note the essential role prayer plays in the healing of vainglory, as with every passion. Through prayer, man receives from God the help without which he remains powerless to conquer any passion whatsoever. But in the case of vainglory, he receives in addition the discernment necessary for foiling all the snares laid for him by the passion. Prayer and watchfulness likewise allows him to be detached from this world, which vainglory has as its object, its unit of analysis, and to attach himself to God. Finally, prayer allows him to glorify God by recognizing that to him is due all glory, honor, and worship. We have observed that the glory that comes from men and the glory that comes from God are conflicting and mutually exclusive. If man must renounce every human glory, this is in order to have access to the divine glory to which his nature destines him. Yet insofar as he remains attached to earthly glory, he can in no way taste that which is heavenly. St. John Climacus notes, As fire does not give birth to snow, so those who seek honor here below will not enjoy it there in heaven. Step 26. This is why humiliation is the necessary path, the indispensable condition for participation in divine glory. In this sense, an elder counsels, if you want to be known by God, be unknown by men. Man, as we have seen, inclines by nature toward glory, but the glory that comes from God is the only one that truly befits him. Thus, he must glory exclusively in God, in conformity with the Apostle's word, quote, we glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3.3. 3. And according to God's promise, quote, those who honor me, I will honor, 1 Kings 2.30. And the search for the glory that comes from the only God, John 5.44, must take the place of man's quest for glory according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 11.18 To conclude, thus Origen advises, despise all glory that comes from men, so as to seek only that which truly deserves the name, the glory that God alone grants to those worthy of it. The more that man strives toward divine glory, the more he loses interest in the glory that comes from men. This is why the love of God and his glory appears as a means of delivering the soul from vainglory. Thus St. John Climacus counsels, Quote, we should be eager to taste the glory that is above. He who has tasted that will despise all earthly glory. It is no less true that the specific antidote for vainglory is humility. Thus, St. Dorotheus of Gaza writes, quote, Christ is the physician of our souls who knows everything and provides each passion with the appropriate remedy. I mean, his commandments. Against vainglory, humility. St. John Cashin advises in like manner, especially regarding vainglory, quote, you must cure what I might refer to as the wounded member of the soul, the virtue of humility. St. John of the latter writes, as soon as holy humility begins to blossom within us, we are at once, we at once begin to hate all human glory and praise. And St. Maximus the Confessor, humility frees the noose from self-esteem. In what follows, we shall see that many of the means recommended by the fathers for the fight against vainglory are the means recommended by them for acquiring humility. 2. Therapy of Pride 
In examining vainglory and pride, we have seen that these passions are so close that some fathers do not consider it absolutely necessary to examine them separately. For our part, following the examples of other holy fathers, we have thought it useful to distinguish them and to present the specific characteristics of each. This implies that we should also treat their therapy separately, but their closeness will necessarily involve some cross-references and repetition. The therapy of pride, like that of vainglory, presupposes a detailed knowledge of the passion, even though pride is not as subtle, multiform, and deceptive as vainglory. St. John Cashin, who considers nosology to be a basic element of the therapy of pride, also stresses in its regard that it is especially important to know the passion's causation. Quote, to shun this lethal virus, we must learn how to detect the causes and origins of this peril. No sickness can be cured, no remedy prescribed for those who are suffering, unless we carefully examine and investigate the causes of the disease. In any case, the general knowledge of the illness makes it possible for man to recognize within himself this passion, which is quite skillful, skilled at making itself unknown or forgotten. Such recognition is quite clearly a prerequisite for the course of therapy, for whoever does not sense that he is sick does not seek out healing. And St. John Climacus notes with regard to those who are blind to the point of being unaware of the pride and dwelling in them, quote, there will be little hope of salvation for those suffering from this malady. Vigilance and discernment allow one to locate the illness, starting at its initial manifestations and to avoid their growing to such magnitude that the passion becomes nearly incurable. Thus St. John Cashin writes, quote, this deadly disease can be reduced to health when early observation enables measures to be taken against its dangerous fevers and perilous attacks while they are still beginning. If we detect its first onset, we can wisely anticipate it with thoughtful precautions. And as much as the illness is contained within certain limits, its therapy remains accessible to human efforts, which must be exercised in several directions. Knowing that pride, like vainglory, renders all our present as well as past efforts vain and removes all value from the virtues one might possess, and being aware of the harshness of divine judgment with regard to the proud, as well as the loss of grace and the sorrows that result from this passion, these facts can contribute to conquering pride. Thus to the question, how does one heal the proud man? St. Basil the Great responds, he is healed by faith in him who said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In other words, by the fear of the sentence incurred by pride. Christ himself endeavors to point out the deadly consequences of pride, saying several times, quote, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, Matthew 23, 12 and Luke 18, 14, and indicating that the Pharisee, despite his virtues, would not be justified on account of his pride. See Luke chapter 18, 9 to 14. Yet, as St. Basil notes, the fear of God does not suffice for treating this illness, since pride generally consists in an elevation of oneself with respect to other people and with respect to God. One can only be healed of it by striving in all circumstances to avoid exalting oneself, destroying the habitual inclination to the passion by a gradual breaking of the habit of holding the attitude characteristic of the passion. This action, this praxis, implies that one show forth a constant inner watchfulness, nipsis, but also that one avoid the company of people who are obviously in the grip of this passion. For this reason, St. Basil completes his response thus, quote, one can only be freed from this passion by abstaining from every exercise of superiority. Just as one unlearns a language or art, not only by ceasing to practice or speak it oneself, but also by ceasing to hear it spoken or see it practiced by others. End of quote. From St. Basil's short rule number 35. To continue, one is helped in this task by meditating on the vanity and emptiness of the things on which man in this passion bases his superiority, the instability of all human things, 
the fleeting character of riches and power, the weakness and fragility of man himself, subject in this world to illness, aging, and death, and who without God is nothing but earth and ashes, shadow and smoke. Pride shows forth in a number of attitudes, confidence in oneself, self-satisfaction, arrogance, assurance, pretensions to knowledge, trust in one's own judgment, the certainty of being right, the compulsion to justify oneself, a spirit of contradiction, the desire to teach or command, the refusal to submit oneself. By striving to take on opposing attitudes, man will be able to fight pride on this level, hatred of one's own will, distrust of one's own judgment, the renunciation of self-justification, self-censure, the refusal to contradict, the refusal to teach or command, attitudes which all find fulfillment in obedience to one's spiritual father and which allow man to regain himself and return to a natural state, as St. Dorotheus of Gaza says. In order to avoid the first form of pride consisting in thinking oneself to be superior to others and in despising them, man must first of all endeavor to note in what things are they are superior to him, to refuse to see their faults and to value their qualities. Especially in this sense, one can say with St. Maximus that love destroys pride. Man must even go so far as to consider himself below all others. Zero. As St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches, quote, standing below all is opposed to the first form of pride. Indeed, how would whoever places himself below his brother be able to believe himself to be greater than his brother or exalt himself in anything to blame or despise someone? The remembrance of one's sins contributes to the removal of the feeling of superiority in man by revealing to him his spiritual poverty, his pride, is all the more reduced when this awareness is accompanied by compunction and self-censure. The acceptance, even the seeking out of dishonors in various forms, likewise, allows for the healing of this passion. St. Dorotheus of Gaza writes, Believe that scorn and insults are for your soul remedies against its pride, and pray for those who mistreat you as being true physicians. Living in, as unknown to men helps in treating the external most form of pride, as St. John Climacus highlights, quote, visible pride is cured by grim conditions. A harsh and humbling way of life also contributes to battling this illness. In the chapter dedicated to bodily ascases, we saw how the soul, to a certain extent, is affected by the, what the body does or undergoes, and how more generally the condition of man's material existence have a certain impact on his inner state. Bodily hurts and the various trials man may be led to undergo in his body purify him of this passion insofar as they cause him to ascertain his weakness and fragility reducing the illusion of self-sufficiency linked to pride insofar as pride consists in thinking of exaltation on account of the natural qualities one possesses a remedy lies in the recognition that every good thing proceeds from god and every quality has its source in the creator of our nature. In this regard, it behooves us to ponder this word of the Holy Apostle, quote, Who sees anything different in you? What have you that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. From this point of view, Evagrius notes to the proud man, quote, You are the creature of God. Do not repudiate, repudiate your creator. From the eight spirits of wickedness. And St. John Climacus, quote, what you received after your birth as also birth itself God gave you. The same saint notes further, it is a sign of the beginning of health when our thought no longer prides itself on its natural gifts. For the spiritual man, however, pride consists above all in exalting himself on account of his virtues. Here the remedy consists in remembering one's sins, a course already in, encountered with regard to the first form of pride, vainglory. And supposing that these virtues are real, whoever exalts himself will thus easily become aware of his mediocrity, 
and thus reduce the passion by considering the perfection of the saints, which is fostered by the frequent and attentive reading of the lives of the Holy Fathers and Mothers. Nevertheless, the essential remedy consists in recognizing that every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of Lights. James 1.17 And in ascribing to God everything good one has been able to do, all the virtues that one possibly possesses, and all the good deeds and thoughts proceeding from these. Again, it is fitting to recall here the above-mentioned word of the Apostle, which St. John Climacus slightly paraphrases. Quote, what hast thou that thou dost not receive as a free gift, either from God or by the cooperation and prayers of others? Evagrius likewise remarks, You have nothing that you did not receive from God. Recognize him who has given to you, and do not exalt yourself any longer. You are helped by God. Do not deny your benefactor. And St. John Cashin teaches, It is possible for us to evade the clutches of this evil spirit if, Whenever we become aware that we have advanced in any virtue, we repeat what St. Paul says, It is not I, but the grace of God which is within me. By the grace of God I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 15.10 The very faculties in us by which ascesis is undertaken and the virtues are practiced are attributable to God. St. John Climacus also writes ironically, only those virtues which you have obtained without the cooperation of the mind belong to you because your mind was given to you by God. Only such victories as you have won without the cooperation of the body have been accomplished by your efforts because the body is not yours but a work of God. And the strength by which our faculties are put into motion as well as the very cause of all our actions have their original source in God. As the Apostle teaches, quote, God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. The cure also consists in recognizing that all spiritual progress one has been able to accomplish has only been such by the grace of God, and sensing that without God's help, one is unable to do anything good whatsoever and preserve the spiritual goods one has acquired. In considering our own efforts and sufferings, although necessary to be nonetheless insufficient for obtaining anything, but that everything is given to us by God, without whose grace we are reduced to utter powerlessness. And, in constantly being aware that it depends not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy, Romans 9.16, and that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build and labor, labor in vain, Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Psalm 126.1 St. John Cassian counsels, Our Savior has instructed us in everything that we do, not only on what to think, but also what to confess. I cannot do anything of myself, he said, but the Father who dwells in me, he does these works. Finally, the remedy consists in realizing that without God's help and protection, we would be overwhelmed by the forces of evil and would give in to the repeated attacks of our spiritual enemies. St. John Cashin advises, Let us learn then, through our perception of our own feebleness and his aid and so many examples, to proclaim daily with the saints, I was on the brink of falling, and the Lord upheld me. The Lord is my strength and my praise. He has become my Savior. Psalm 117, verse 13 and following. Prayer, especially if it is continual, constitutes a basic remedy against pride insofar as man, when praying, asks for God's help, aid, and protection. Consequently, he cannot help but be aware that what he receives in response to his prayer comes as a gift from God and cannot be attributed to his own strength or merit. Likewise, the prayer of thanksgiving allows one to vanquish the passion to the extent that man, through such prayer, if he makes it with a broken and contrite heart, not as the Pharisee, straightway recognizes God and not himself as the source and end of the goods he possesses, and henceforth considers himself only their unworthy steward. St. Dorotheus of Gaza explains this fact. 
Continuous prayer is opposed to the second kind of pride. Whoever prays ceaselessly to God knows the source of whatever good work he may be given to accomplish and cannot be proud about it or ascribe it to his own might. He ascribes every good work to God and never ceases to thank and invoke him, fearing lest the loss of such aid make manifest to him his weakness and powerlessness. But of course, the role of prayer is also to ask God for help in the healing of this passion of pride, which more than any other passion can completely elude human attempts at therapy. As St. John Climacus indicates several times, quote, invisible pride can be healed only by him who before the ages is invisible. And men can cure the lustful, angels the guileful, but only God the proud. The majority of the means presented above for healing pride are also, as we shall see, means for acquiring humility, for humility in truth constitutes the main cure for pride inasmuch as it is the virtue opposed to it and is called to be substituted in its place. St. Gregory of Nyssa observes, Humility will bring haughtiness to ruin, modesty will heal sickly pride. St. Barsanufius writes, Our great and heavenly physician has given us remedies and poultices. Above all, he has given us humility, which drives out all pride. Similarly, St. John Cassian notes, quote, God, the creator and redeemer of all, knowing that pride is the source and origin of evil, worked to heal opposites by opposites, so that what pride has overthrown might rise again through humility. And elsewhere, if the plague of vice infects the reasonable part, it will beget the vices of vainglory, arrogance, envy, pride, presumption. Hence you must cure what I might refer to as this first member of the soul with the virtue of humility. St. Dorotheus of Gaza expresses himself in like terms. Christ shows us the cause which leads all the way to disdain and the transgression of God's precepts. Thus he provides us with the cure for this, so that we might be able to obey and be saved. What then is this remedy, and what is the source of scorn? Listen to what our Lord himself says. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Behold, he shows us succinctly, in a single word, the root and source of all evils, along with its remedy, the source of all goods. He shows us that it is raising oneself up that causes us to fall, and that it is impossible to obtain mercy except through a contrary disposition, namely, humility. 3. Humility Humility is simultaneously opposed to vainglory and pride. And just as there are two forms of pride, one can distinguish between two corresponding forms of humility. Humility with regard to men and humility with regard to God. Even though the latter is the goal of the former, one cannot dispense with the former. For this reason, St. Barsanufius takes great care to advise, humble yourselves in truth, not only before God, but also before men. And St. John Cashin stresses that no one can attain the goal of perfect purity except through true humility, which he should display first to his brethren and then to God. Before presenting each of these two forms of humility, let us note that for man, humility in general consists in recognizing one's limits, weakness, powerlessness, and ignorance. This is one of the basic patristic definitions of the virtue as enumerated by St. John Climacus. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, A man who has attained to knowing the extent of his weakness has touched the perfection of humility. Sedical Homily 73 However, humility does not consist only in recognizing and accepting real weakness and mediocrity, but also in voluntarily abasing oneself, even though one possesses certain qualities. St. John Chrysostom notes that this is the very definition of the word humility. Humility, he says, quote, consists in regarding oneself as nothing despite the grandeur and number of one's merits. And elsewhere, true humility consists in abasing oneself when one has the opportunity to exalt oneself. Likewise, St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, the one who is humble in truth is he who secretly has something to boast about 
and does not boast, but sees in himself nothing more than a bit of earth. From his homily on Genesis. Oh, there's ascetical homily number 20. The humble man does not think anything of himself and attaches no importance to himself. He sees himself as a man of no family. He even goes so far as to put himself down. St. Isaac the Syrian writes further, the humble man sees himself as a despicable man. And St. John Climacus remarks, humility is an abyss of self-depreciation. Humility is thus characterized by self-detachment in all things. This self-detachment is shown by the renunciation of one's own will, which goes as far as hatred of one's will, and which the Holy Fathers con consider to be such a basic characteristic of humility that they use it to define the virtue. It is also shown to be by the absence of trust in oneself and distrust regarding one's own judgment, qualities close to what was just mentioned and often cited along with it, from which follow unhesitating obedience to one's spiritual father, the refusal to justify oneself and impose one's own advice in relations with other people, the abandonment of every spirit of dispute and opposition, the refusal to contradict and even to enter into discussion, and consequently the taking on of an oft silent bearing. Since these attitudes are manifested in the first place with regard to the spiritual father, they bear witness to humility not only toward people, but also toward God, of whom the spiritual father is a witness and whose will the latter points out. Specifically, with regard to one's neighbor, humility in opposition to the first kind of pride, for man consists not only in not considering oneself to be superior to others, but also in considering others as superior to oneself. This is the teaching of St. Paul, who recommends, quote, in humility count others better than yourselves, Philippians 2.3. Naturally, the fathers take up this teaching. Thus to the question, what is humility? St. Basil straightway responds, Following the Apostles' commandment, humility consists in regarding others as being above oneself. St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches, The first kind of humility consists in holding one's brother to be more intelligent than oneself and superior in everything. St. John Chrysostom, he says, quote, True humility consists in giving way to those who are below us and preferring to ourselves those who seem to be our in inferiors. If we reflect, we shall think that no one is our inferior, but rather believe that everyone surpasses us. And St. John Climacus in his chapter, dedicated to humility. In step 25, notes, quote, If in the perception of our heart we consider that our neighbor excels us in all things, then divine mercy is near us. Such an attitude, however, could remain proud if while considering others as superior to oneself, one still held oneself to be great. For this reason, the fathers say further and more often, directly following Christ's own teaching in Mark 9.35, that humility consists in considering oneself inferior to all and in seeing oneself as the last of all men. At the highest degree of humility, man considers himself not only inferior to his fellow human beings, but also inferior to all creatures of nature. Whereas the proud man, thinking himself to be superior to others, despises them, the humble man, on the contrary, considers himself to be inferior to all, holds himself alone worthy of scorn, and accepts without affliction or turmoil all the forms of dishonor that come from other people. St. John Cashin counsels, Considering ourselves inferior to others, we cheerfully accept whatever is asked of us, however burdensome, depressing, or injurious, because those we consider our superiors require it. Elsewhere, he notes that one of the signs by which humility is recognized is that we bear injury ourselves without grieving or complaining. St. John Climacus notes that it is indignity that tests the heart. A man may be humble in his thoughts, but only the absence of turmoil when he should be subjected to dishonor will reveal if he's truly humble. And it is a sign of even greater humility to accept this humiliation with joy. 
Moreover, the humble man does not put up with being accorded value in any matter whatsoever with regard to others. He is not content with enduring scorn and even accepting it with joy, but he seeks it out. Thus, St. John Climacus writes, If the limit and rule and character of extreme pride is for a man to feign such virtues as he does not possess for the sake of glory, then it follows that a sign of the deepest humility will be to abase ourselves by pretending to have faults we do not possess. To accept humiliation without disturbance is to eliminate, when faced with whatever has dishonored us, every reaction of anger, rancor, and animosity. St. John Climacus notes that one of humility's properties is the loss of all bad temper. One father observes, humility does not get angry and does not make anyone angry. While another states, humility is abandoning anger. And Abba Isaiah writes, humility is peaceful toward all men. The humble man straightway forgives whoever despises or offends him. An elder was asked, what is humility? And the elder responded, if your brother sins against you and you forgive him before he comes asking your forgiveness. The truly humble man, says St. John Climacus, is he who maintains the same love for the very man who reproaches him. And an elder who was asked, what is humility, replies even more positively, it is to do good to those who have done evil to you. The humble man shows himself to be dutiful and subject toward all. He makes himself the servant of all. Following Christ's example and in accordance with his recommendations, quote, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Mark 9.35 Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. With regard to God, humility consists first of all in recognizing oneself to be a sinner. Sedical Homily number 20 St. Dorotheus of Gaza in his instruction dedicated to humility recalls that the more the saints draw near to God, the more they themselves see themselves as sinners. Abba Isaiah teaches that humility is even considering oneself to be more sinful than all men. Likewise, St. John Climacus notes in his recension of the great patristic definitions of this virtue that humility is the acknowledgement of oneself as the greatest sinner of all. This thought with regard to one's own sins is naturally accompanied by self-censure and self-condemnation. Furthermore, humility consists in constantly forgetting about one's works and in refusing to see any potential virtue one has. Here, humility brings about a state of inner bareness and nudity. For this reason, St. John Chrysostom likens this virtue nearly every time he speaks about it to the spiritual poverty mentioned by Christ above all in the Beatitudes. Quote, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.3 The saint says, Who are those whom Jesus calls poor in spirit? They are the humble. And St. Isaac the Syrian, pondering this state in its perfection, writes that the truly humble man goes so far as to want to become in creation as one who does not exist, as one who has not yet come into being, entirely unknown, even in, in his own soul. Sedical Homily 81. On a more moderate level, St. John Climacus observes that when this queen of virtues makes progress in our soul by spiritual growth, we regard all the good deeds accomplished by us as nothing. The humble man thus considers himself to be a useless servant in conformity with Christ's recommendation. When you have done all that is commanded, you say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Luke 17.10 he goes so far as to consider himself to be a bad worker and to despise himself as doing nothing good before God. Consequently, the humble man thinks that he does not deserve all the goods he possesses, that he is unworthy of them, that he is in debt because of them. He recognizes that without God, he would not have been able to do any good. This leads us to another great classical definition of humility, the most important of all, and in some way, their apex. Humility is, quote, the recognition of divine grace 
and divine compassion. Or more precisely, the recognition that without God's help and aid, one would have been unable and will never be able to do anything good. That every good we possess, no matter what, comes from Him and is in no way attributable to us. That all progress we make has only taken place thanks to Him and that every quality or virtue we possess is a gift of His grace, being in no way ascribable to our own value or merit and unable to be preserved without His constant aid. Thus, humility amounts to ascribing to God everything good one has and everything good one has done. St. Dorotheus of Gaza says, Such is the perfect humility of the saints. From this perspective, St. Barsanufius advises, If something good happens to you, you must recognize that it is the free gift of God that comes to you from his goodness. And St. Macarios the Great describes this attitude well. Even if it practices all the virtues, the soul that loves God customarily attributes nothing to itself but refers everything back to God. For everything a man has, all the visible goods by which each person may do good, the earth and all that is in it, one's very body and soul, everything is God's. Being itself, its being itself is possessed by man only by grace. What then remains to him of his own, of which he might reasonably boast, or by which he might justify himself? Yet God receives from men this immense thanksgiving, which pleases him most among all we offer him, that the soul refer back to God alone all the good it can do, all the effort it makes for him, all that it undertakes, all that it knows, and that it attribute everything to him. Humility appears here, to be an inseparable form, inseparable from prayer, especially from the prayer of petition, since by it man manifests that he in no way counts on his own strength, and that he recognizes his own powerlessness to achieve by himself what he asks. Rather, he shows through the prayer that he expects every good from God alone. Likewise, he recognizes that he can neither accomplish nor preserve anything without God's help, aid, and protection. And if he prays constantly, he cannot help but be aware that everything he receives, he receives from God in response to his prayer, not by virtue of any of his own merit, but as a free gift. Thus, St. Maximus writes, Humility consists in prayer combined with tears and suffering. For this ceaseless calling upon God for help prevents us from foolishly growing confident in our own strength and wisdom. St. Dorotheus of Gaza speaks in the same vein, it is evident that the pious and humble man, knowing that nothing good can be done in his soul without God's aid and protection, never ceases to call upon him that he might be merciful to him. Whoever prays ceaselessly to God knows the source of whatever good work he may be given to accomplish. He ascribes every good work to God and never ceases to thank and invoke him, fearing lest the loss of such aid make manifest to him his weakness and powerlessness. Thus humility causes him to pray, and prayer makes him humble. But humility is accompanied above all by the prayer of thanksgiving, through which man immediately attributes his good actions and every good manner of goods he has received to God, considering himself as a simple intermediary and steward. He shows himself as grateful to God and praises him as the sole source of every good. Finally, let us note that humility is likewise inseparable from contrition of heart, repentance, and compunction. For if in describing humility, we have constantly spoke of recognition, of the superiority of others, of one's own in inferiority, of one's sinful state, of one's powerlessness to do good and preserve such good, of God as the sole source of the good one possesses and does, etc. This has not been a discussion of some abstract recognition but of a recognition by the heart, more precisely a recognition proceeding from a broken and contrite heart. Psalm 50. The fathers liken humility to contrition of heart with the aim of understanding this fact. Footnote, Dorotheus of Gaza, for example, uses both expressions in equal measure. Quote, without humility, it is impossible to obey the commandments or to do any good whatsoever. As Abba Mark the monk says, without contrition of heart, 
it is impossible to free oneself from evil and absolutely impossible to acquire a single virtue. Thus it is through contrition of heart that one accepts the commandments, distances oneself from evil, and acquires the virtues. From Dorotheus of Gaza's Instruction 1.10 To continue, St. John Climacus defines humility as the feeling of a contrite soul. And commenting on the passage from Psalm 50 we just mentioned, St. John Chrysostom notes that the psalmist requires by this an advanced degree of humility, a breaking. And inquiring elsewhere about those whom Jesus calls poor in spirit, he responds, they are the humble and those who have a contrite heart. For by the word spirit, he means the heart and the will. Further on, he states, humility has several degrees. David praises this perfect humility, which does not consist merely in abasement, but in a complete breaking of the heart. When he says the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. St. John Climacus observes that if repentance, compunction, and humility are to be distinguished and are different, this is the case with beginners. But with the advanced, this holy threefold cord unites into one power and activity. It acquires its own effects and properties, and whatever one names as an in indication of one of them is a token also of the other. The modes of acquiring humility are nearly identical with the means employed to heal someone of vainglory and pride. Indeed, we've seen that in general, the reduction of a given passion implies the acquisition of the corresponding virtue and a vice versa. Sometimes the fathers mention fighting against the passion and sometimes the means for acquiring the virtue since it is possible in the spiritual pro process to distinguish as we've shown between a positive and negative moment according to the psalmist's word turn away from evil and do good psalm 33 14 but the means indicated in both cases are practically the same and the two moments within the process go hand in hand thus in order to acquire humility the fathers primarily recommend not paying attention to one's neighbor's faults and not judging him exhibiting charity toward him in every circumstance considering him to be superior to oneself, and above all, considering oneself as inferior to him, no matter who he be. Whoever wants to become humble must further hide his own qualities and virtues from himself and others, recognize his weakness, pay attention to his own faults, constantly recall his own sins, and blame and condemn himself. From this it seems that compunction and tears are a path of special access to humility. Moreover, one ought to endure the various dishonors, insults, and scorn that come from others, and even seek these out. The renunciation of one's own will and obedience, which contributes the most to this, also constitute essential modes of acquiring this virtue. Bodily toil and trials of all kinds likewise promote this virtue's acquisition, along with distancing oneself from this world detachment, non-acquisitiveness, simplicity in all domains, the willingness to be unknown and self-effacing, silence and solitude, the virtues of temperance, meekness, the fear of God and love also lead to humility. Of course, prayer plays an essential role, all the more so since humility always appears as a gift of God and a virtue which one can only learn from him. As Christ points out, Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. For this latter reason, the fathers moreover recommend that one consider the example of the saints and frequent the company of men who possess this virtue, and above all, that one take as a model Christ, who provides the highest example of this in his kenosis, his self-emptying, his acceptance of a life in poverty and obscurity, the silent enduring of insults and affronts at the time of his passion, and his perfect obedience to his Father. Faithful to Christ's commandment to learn humility from him, St. Isaac advises, see what he who has ordained humility and given this grace has done in order to acquire it. Be like him, and you shall find it. In the framework of praxis, 
Humility is called to occupy a fundamental position. Along with love, it is the Christian virtue par excellence. Thus, St. John Chrysostom does not hesitate to say, quote, the foundation of our philosophy is humility. It is the foundation of every spiritual edifice, the building of which is man's task. It is the very source of the spiritual life. This can be understood by the fact that pride lies at the root of man's fall and is the cause of his fallen existence. Thus man cannot hope to rebuild himself if he does not take as his foundation humility, which is the remedy for pride and thus one of the main sources of healing. St. John Chrysostom explains, quote, Jesus Christ gives humility the first place among his beatitudes, since this deluge of evils inundating the whole earth has no other source but pride. As pride, so to speak, was the culmination of man's sin and the root and source of all the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, in order to heal it with contrary cure, first establishes this law of humility as the unshakable foundation of the building he wishes to build. When this foundation has been placed, whoever undertakes construction will be able to erect the rest of the edifice without fear. But if it happens to be lacking, the building might reach to the heavens, but will of a necessity topple over and fall into ruin. Commentary in the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. John Chrysostom. St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches likewise. Christ shows us the cause which leads all the way to disdain and the transgression of God's precepts. Thus he provides us with the cure for this so that we might be able to obey and be saved. What then is this remedy and what is the source of scorn? Listen to what our Lord himself says. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Behold, He shows us succinctly in a single word the root and source of all evils, along with its remedy, the source of all goods. He shows us that it is raising oneself up that causes us to fall, and that it is impossible to obtain mercy except through a contrary disposition, namely humility. In so far as pride appears as the first cause of the fall, humility may appear to be the first cause of salvation. Thus St. John Climacus writes, An angel fell from heaven without any other passion except pride. And so we may ask whether it is possible to ascend to heaven by humility alone without any other virtues. At any rate, it is the condition sine qua non of salvation. Without humility, no one will enter the marriage chamber, writes St. John Climacus in step 25, who elsewhere presents this virtue as the door of the kingdom. Without humility, not only is no perfection possible in any way, but man also remains separated from God. As St. Macarius the Great categorically states, quote, wherever there is no humility, God is also not there. Abba Isaiah also teaches, before all else we need humility. No virtue may be truly acquired without it, neither can any virtue subsist without it. Abba Theodore also affirms, Whoever does not have humility has not fulfilled any of the commandments. For without humility, none of the virtues is accepted to him who accepts them, Christ. And St. John Chrysostom, quote, To build on another foundation is to be condemned for having done nothing lasting and for laboring in vain. St. Isaac the Syrian teaches in the same vein, quote, As long as man has not humbled himself, he does not receive the wages for his work. The recompense is not given for the labor, but for humility. Whoever neglects the latter loses the former. Grace is given through humility. Thus the recompense does not come from the virtue nor from the efforts one makes to its end, but from humility. If one does not have humility, the work of virtue is in vain. Sadako Homily 37 Works without humility serve no purpose. Outside the context of humility, all our works are in vain, All our virtues are in vain, and all our pains are in vain. True labor does not exist without humility, and without humility no virtue is true. One can thus say with St. Gregory the Great that the essential foundation of a virtue is humility. And it is understandable why the fathers consider humility to be the basis, but also as the head 
the mother, and the source of all the other virtues. Humility plays a significant role in man's spiritual healing. Without it, it is impossible to free oneself from evil. Through it, more than through any other means, is man able to be healed of all his ills. St. John Climacus cites in this regard the example of Manasseh. Quote, Manasseh sinned as no other man. If the whole world had undertaken a fast for him, it could have made no recompense for this. But humility had power to remedy even what was incurable in him. It is one of the primary remedies given to men by Christ in light of the healing of the, their spiritual illnesses. Thus, a Holy Father advises, let us gather the remedies of the soul, that is, humility. For the great physician of souls, Christ our God is near, and he wishes to heal us. Let us not despise him. Indeed, humility allows man to obtain the forgiveness of all his faults, to be purified of all his sins, and to be delivered from all his passions. For this reason, St. John Climacus writes, quote, For all the passions mentioned, the remedy is humility. Those who have obtained that virtue have overcome all. But without it, man can conquer no passion. Without it, he cannot claim to attain to purity. Humility appears to be the only virtue that allows one to conquer the devil and his demons in spiritual combat. Indeed, is the only virtue they are unable to accomplish. A saying of the Desert Fathers also relates that a demon said to St. Macarios, quote, Everything that you have, we have also. You distinguish yourselves from us only in humility. For this reason, it may be considered as the sole virtue that saves man. By humility, man is able to evade all the snares and wiles of the demons, face up effectively to all temptations, and victoriously counter all the attacks of the enemy. Abba Anthony says, I saw all the nets of the enemy spread out on the earth, and groaning I said, Who then can escape these snares? And I heard a voice reply to me, Humility. St. John Climacus, citing in this sense the psalmist, likewise stresses the preventative power of humility. Quote, humility is a tower of strength against the face of the enemy. No advantage shall his enemy have over him, nor shall the son, or rather the thought, of iniquity avail to hurt him any more. But he will hew down his enemies before his face, and them that hate him shall he put to flight. So to another father says, If we are humble, the Lord will distance the enemy from us and will help us preserve our souls at all times. And St. Dorotheus states, Humility protects the soul from every passion, from every temptation. In truth, nothing is more powerful than humility. Whoever possesses it can fall no longer, observes St. Barthesanufius. Because it purifies man of every passion and preserves him against every attack of the enemy, but also because it gives him strength of heart and subjects everything to him by subjugating his soul to God, humility permits man to be without fear, dread, or turmoil, and to know inner peace. Thus St. Isaac the Syrian writes, Quote, in the humble man, there's never haste, hurry, confusion, or any passionate or shallow thought. Rather, he remains at peace at all times. If the fire of heaven falls to the earth, the humble man does not fear. Every man who is calm is not humble, but every humble man is calm. The humble man is always at peace, for there is nothing that stirs up or troubles his thoughts. Seneca Homily 81. Humility allows man to accept all the trials and sufferings that come to him without being affected by them. Humility thus appears as the mother of dispassion. This, as we shall see, is not merely the absence of passion, but rather the possession of all the virtues. As we've seen, humility is the prerequisite for all the virtues, that which makes all virtues authentic. And it, along with love, is not merely the foundation, but the crowning of the spiritual edifice. One can say that it implies and yet simultaneously presupposes all the virtues. Thus, Abba Theodore writes, The fulfillment of the commandments is humility in which God rests. Whoever accomplishes humility accomplishes all the commandments. And St. Isaac the Syrian remarks that this virtue encompasses everything within itself. 
For this reason, it is not possible to consider just anyone as humble. Humility in its perfection is a virtue that only the perfect saints receive when they have led to completion the ascesis of their life. It is only given to those who attain to the perfection of virtue by the strength of grace. Healing man of all his passions and encompassing all the virtues, humility allows man to regain his original nature and to become truly human once again. As St. Dorotheus of Gaza says, it allows him to pull himself together and return to a natural state. In so doing, it allows for his return to health. Thus, St. John Chrysostom observes that the soul is healthy through humility. Humility thus appears as the mother, the root, the nourishment, the link, and the basis of all good things. As we've seen, this virtue is not merely a source of inner peace, but also of true life, of spiritual joy, the opposite of pride, which was the source of death and the deprivation of authentic pleasure. Humility raises man up to love, which, as we shall see, is the summit of praxis. It is also one of the primary prerequisites for accessing spiritual knowledge, illumination. St. Isaac the Syrian writes, Whoever possesses perfect humility has entered into the mystery of all spiritual natures. He bears in himself the wisdom of creation in all exactitude, yet thinks he knows nothing. Behold, this is what Holy Scripture has said. The mysteries are revealed to the humble. To the humble, it is given to receive in themselves the spirit of revelations who discloses mysteries. For this reason, the saints have said that the soul fulfills humility in divine contemplations. Theoria. Sedical homily number 20. Humility then allows man to experience the ineffable light, the uncreated light making him a participant in divine glory. Thus following Solomon who states, he who is lowly in spirit will obtain glory. Proverbs 29, 23. Saint Isaac the Syrian advises, descend lower than yourself and you will see the glory of God. For where humility sprouts there, the glory of God spreads forth. Sadako Humley 5. Here is one of the fulfillments of Christ's promise. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. If the effects of humility are so important, it is because the virtue is one of the primary sources for the reception of divine grace in man, just as pride was one of the main causes of its deprivation. Thus the psalmist observes, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. And God himself, the God-man, Theanthropos, through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, the Logos says, quote, this is the man to whom I will look, he that is humble. Isaiah 66, 2. God gives grace to the humble. Teach the holy apostles Peter and James. 1 Peter 5, 5, James 4, 6. Following the author of the book of Proverbs, we have seen that the virtues have value on account of humility, so much so that St. Isaac the Syrian does not hesitate to say that it is through humility that grace is given and that humility is the precursor of grace. This is explained above all by the fact that humility is man's recognition of his own weakness, his own nothingness, at the same time as his recognition of God's omnip omnipotence. Through humility, man renounces his own will, thus making himself completely permeable to the activity of the divine will. He ceases to be attached to himself and opens up to the grace for which he asks through his prayer and of which he strives to be worthy through the keeping of the divine commandments. In obedience, St. Makarios writes in this vein, even if it practices all the virtues, the soul that loves God customarily attributes nothing to itself, but refers everything back to God, whereas God in turn, attentive to the health and uprightness of the noose and knowledge of such a soul, gives it everything. For this last reason, humility, along with love, appears as the virtue that unites man most to God. End of part five, Therapy of Passions.